फाइनली कितने कंट्री कितने रजिस्ट्रेशन ट्वेंटी कंट्री अरे ऑडियो ऑफ करो ना ट्वेंटी कंट्रीज एंड नंबर ऑफ नमस्कार डॉक्टर सुशीला आई एम संदीप नायक नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग Good morning, Dr. Blusham Kosher. Good morning. Good morning. This is Sandeep Naik. So, Sandeep. so nice to be here. It's wonderful, wonderful to be here. When I'm supposed to speak this morning. नमस्कार मीना जी अवस्थी बोल रहा हूँ नमस्कार ठीक है स्वास्थ्य ठीक है आपका अवस्थी जी बिल्कुल ठीक है बिल्कुल ठीक है साहब गुड नाइस टू सी यू ना एवर यंग मैन ऑलवेज थैंक यू स्माइलिंग थैंक यू Thank 
Vamos fazer talvez o seguinte, talvez a gente vá para o stop aí.
नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग आम करम विक्रमजीत सिंह चीफ डायरेक्टर एन सी डी सी एंड ज्वाइंट कोऑर्डिनेटर ऑफ द वेबिनार इट इज मैलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू टू द इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार एंटरप्रनरशिप डेवलपमेंट ऑन सी वीड business by cooperatives jointly organized by linac ncdc department of fisheries government of india and nidac i am pleased to announce that today's webinar has aroused huge enthusiasm from stakeholders across the globe i am sure that with the inputs from all the distinguished speakers and the deliberation thereon will go a long way in promoting entrepreneurship in seaweed business especially through cooperatives it is going to be an important input for improving socio economic status of people in asia and the pacific and india in particular thank you jai hind yeah uh thank you vikram vikram jing singh ji uh and uh, uh greetings from nidac bangkok uh my name is uh Salin Krishna. I am representing the NIDAC in Bangkok, the network of uh, development of agriculture cooperatives in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, today, we have decided to organize this webinar, which is a very important topic for the region, the Asia Pacific region, because seaweed production has not yet caught up in this region as expected. Uh, as we know, seaweeds have a lot of potential, uh, both as a food and also as a industry uh, input, uh, with several industrial applications from cosmetic to pharmaceutical industries. So I would like to welcome all the participants here. We have an excellent panel involving uh, policymakers, scientists, and also industry leaders. so i think this will be a good opportunity for you to discuss and deliberate on how to enhance the sustainable production uh, consumption and utilization of seaweeds in the region thank you very much and welcome again namaskar good morning to everybody i i am sandeep naik i am managing director of national cooperative development corporation of government of india i am also chairman of uh, the elected chairman of neda uh, this is a great occasion for government of india the uh, department of fisheries the uh, national academy for cooperative research of ncdc and neda to join together to host this uh, timely and uh, very fruitful webinar on seaweeds at the very beginning i must uh, thank all the distinguished panelists and also the participants for taking uh, steps to register and be present in this uh, webinar which is live being live streamed on six channels uh, on this zoom alone uh, there are more than 200 uh, people registered uh, participating but on the live stream channels six channels there are thousands others who are uh, participating nedak comprises of uh, coastal countries uh, it is a great occasion for nedac to host the coastal countries who are its members uh, spanning from africa middle east uh, to the oceania philippines uh, and things like that so all those people uh, nedac member from nedac member countries are uh, participating i am extremely uh, thankful to uh, professor salin krishna from nedac bangkok for Uh, putting together the experts and panelists in this group i also want to thank uh, dr rajiv ranjan the federal secretary for fisheries of government of india for having agreed to address the webinar and uh, uh, talk about the path that the government of india has in seaweed participation uh, production and its harvesting i thank uh, dr shopin he has a very um is very early in the morning for him in uh, the east coast of uh, uh, canada uh, i also thank other participants dr anisia from philippines dr nagia from vietnam 
and uh, our uh, uh, dr susila uh, dr blossom kochar and above all uh, our great friend of nedak as well as ncdc dr avasti uh, and uh, atul seth uh, ji uh, the uh, ms nime from chennai and others thank you very much uh, now i will not take much time i will request uh, dr rajiv ranjan to give his uh, speech for the chief as chief guest of this very timely webinar thank you mr naik and uh, uh, i am very happy uh, to be participating in this international webinar on uh, seaweed business uh, development and uh, as mentioned uh, the government of india is very keen that uh, seaweed uh, the, uh, you know the whole uh, cultivation and the entire value chain is developed this is one area where we feel uh, should be taken on a very high priority level and we have done that in terms of so i'll be sharing in the next 10 minutes very quickly some of it there is a small presentation which i'll just uh, uh, get on with it and uh, we will skip through many of the introductory slides and come and tell you what are things which uh, government of india has planned and what has been already done in order to launch uh, i would say this seaweed mission kind of a thing Uh, we have prepared a very detailed uh, action plan and strategy for the next 5 years and uh, we all know that uh, uh, it's a really global value market and uh, can you just share the thing quickly if you can get it quickly and then uh, yeah uh, just uh, go to the uh, next one yeah so this is the uh, the global market is almost 12 billion uh, next uh, this is uh, the india has a very insignificant uh, presence at this point of time and that is what we need to do now to look at how we can change that next this again uh, is general uh, right now only 5000 tons of cultured seaweed are produced and about 25000 tons of wild seaweed is collected for market value of 300 to 500 because the way uh, the sea would uh, the, we don't have full details because it's very very uh, uh, scattered uh, and uh, informal sector that is there but uh, i'll very quickly cover as to what are things that we have done next users of seaweed i'll not go because there are uh, very eminent uh, people who will be covering each aspect of it in great detail and uh, i'm very happy to have a galaxy of people who will represent each of them so uh, they will be doing justice to each of the uh, various usage next please now this again is a big area large scale opportunity not only in biofuels biopolymers bio based chemicals seaweed sap as animal you know uh, food and feed both for poultry and cattle and this is again very important for reduce methane emission and uh, there are very many things that we can do with that i will not going to this again but food products for human consumption itself a us 5 billion dollar market which is something again in india we are not exploiting and we would like to now get into this area also next please there uh, the important cultivable species uh, uh, next please capophagus uh, gracilaria these are the things which we will so i will not go now these are the methods of seaweed cultivation either the raft monoline or tube net and we are looking at all three of them next please in how to uh, get on with uh, so seaweed value chain this is important and we are now looking at i will not go into details of because of time constraint but we can see now that one is just uh, getting the production and then after the harvesting how do we produce sap from wet, uh, wet seaweed and how we uh, get a uh, uh, seaweed powder then agar and carrageenan how do we look that and then bio fertilizer so all these uh, things we have looked at it in detail and the idea is to use the self help you know women groups to get into it and it will also be a huge employment provider next please this is uh, what have been there are many bodies the department of fisheries is working with uh, very many research institutes the national 
uh, Fisheries Development Board has been funding it, which is with us, the Department of Fisheries, uh, has the National Fisheries Development Board, which has been giving funding support to various organizations like the CSM CRI, the, which is in Bhavnagar in Gujarat, the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute, the National Institute of Technology, and various state government departments. So uh, about five and a half crores uh, funding has gone into it, but we want to scale it up to 100 times. So uh, we have now 100, six, 650 crore uh, you know, spending in the next five years. This is what we are trying to say, that we have a hundredfold increases what we are looking at it, which, which is challenging. So it is a collaborative effort, mm -hmm. which we can do either for training and demonstration and uh, for establishment of seaweed processing units for making the seed banks and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, we are primarily looking at Gracilaria and Capophagus, uh, which are uh, the dominant species in terms of commercial application. Next, please. Uh, if you look at it, the NFDB funded, we have been doing that again. A uh, lot of trainings and 1,600 beneficiaries. This is in Tamil Nadu. Uh, uh, there is a FIMSUL project which looked at it. And there are a lot of learnings and a lot of valuable, uh, you know, uh, inputs have come for this. Next, please. The Pradhan Mantri Mata Sampada Yojana, as um, some of you may be aware, is a 20,000 crore scheme and uh, for the next five years. And this is a game changer. Mm -hmm as far as the fisheries uh, development in the country is concerned. And this looks at the entire value chain. And we are now looking at a target of 640 crores investment in the next five years. And this will increase the opportunities for increasing the income of seaweed farmers in a very big way. Next, please. So under this, we are, want to enhance the production and productivity of the seaweed aquaculture. And we also want to look at the entire value chain and look at industrial product diversification to meet the domestic demand. And also this will reduce dependence on imports, which will be part of our At Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. Also, we want to promote seaweed as a viable and sustainable livelihood and uh, among the communities, especially women, and to establish an institutional mechanism in research and development in the seaweed farming and value chain and the mechanism for effective transfer of technology. These are the broad objectives. Next, please. So if you look at the SWOT, and I'll not go into details because I'm sure the uh, speakers later will cover each of it in great detail, but there are huge opportunities. So we have been mindful of the weaknesses. We are looking at what the strengths are and what the threats are. And accordingly, we have come up with a very detailed strategy. And this is what I'll very quickly try to cover. Next, please. Uh, what are the broad strategy? We are looking at intensive efforts to, uh, to prioritize formation and promotion of uh, the uh, farmer producer organization. Basically, the women's self-help groups will be upgraded to become a producer organization, support to cooperatives and women SSGs, because this is a cooperative-led uh, uh, initiative. So this is, fits into the self-help groups getting upgraded and women's self-help cooperatives and how we can formalize it. And then this will be, this we have done recently when we uh, visited uh, Tamil Nadu last week, along with the Honorable Minister, we interacted with them and this is what will ensure area expansion, ensuring quality seed supply. It will also ensure the uh, enhancing R&D in seaweed farming and value chain, the market promotion, capital investment will come in, utilization of existing skill and uh, labor and integrated cluster base. We, it's a, it has to be an integrated cluster base approach then only we can scale it up in a big way. Next, please. So what we have been you know, looking at various ways where organizing workshops like what we are having now for outreach and enhancing the... So all these things are now getting done in each way. And this is the, uh, the roadmap for the next five years. The idea is to look at 11.2 lakh tons of production. And we have done a year-wise incremental mapping of it state-wise also. Next, please. Next, we'll show how we can look at, uh, you know, state-wise, each state has to come in and we have given production targets for the state and we are working with each state and union territory to ensure that these targets, because what is very important is to ensure production to begin with. And after that will come the value uh, chain development. So this is essential and this is where quality seed material, all that has been tied up. 
and this is what uh, we want to do next please <coughs> so uh, these are the funds allocated for the states and uh, and this is for seaweed cultivation <laughs> as well as additional investment for interventions like seed banks genetic improvement programs for high yield cultivars seaweed parks this is what we want to establish next please so there is a convergence that we need to do and this is what again several departments several things are being planned and we have got a detailed strategy because it is not just one department it is a you know we have to work with everybody who has interest in it with the industry with the cooperatives and make sure that this happens and ultimately you know some of it uh, will be so this is what we have planned as i said time constraint doesn't let me go into details of the thing i will just quickly now end with a couple of uh, next please we uh, to tell you what we have done we have uh, done tamil nadu you know we have sanctions uh, present sanctions are being shown what are the uh, you know total numbers uh, we have been uh, you know looking at it and uh, proposals from research institutes are under there so you can see now a huge scaling up in terms of what has happened in the last few months because the uh, pradhan mantri sampada yojana was just launched a few months back and we have this i am highlighting that element of seaweed out of that huge program and this will help in terms of establish a seaweed uh, culture rafts and so on and so on bank for seaweed and so on so we are also looking at various states and uh, uh, taking on their lessons earlier and and using it to scale it up in a big way next please so these are some uh, pictures of our recent visit on uh, you know 23rd a few days back we were in the rameshwaram mandapam area and uh, we launched the program along with the honorable minister and uh, you can see that uh, some pictures being taken so this also this we interacted uh, with the uh, with the uh, cultivators and it was very very useful it gave us a lot of uh, you know energy and insight that there is a huge possibility of development yes, here yes. we can do and we are on the right track next please so i will uh, next please so these are again some uh, you know a visit to aqua agri seaweed processing plant and i am happy that uh, mr aviram seth is also there he will uh, give you details because what is needed is to have a market and and that is why i am also happy that if uh, you know dr avasti is there and we will uh, you know uh, elaborate because very important to ensure that there is good market and there is a good in fact it was a happy augury that the uh, the, the price which the uh, the uh, people who are getting out of it they are getting more and more of it which will attract much many large number of women to come into this area and this is will help in employment generation and a livelihood uh, you know efforts will be taken Uh, care of so this is a very big development in that because we are looking at a potential of almost 4 lakh women getting into this so this is a very big number and that is what we are saying that market development and uh, reforms have to come into it and uh, ultimately money has to be made then only you see it will be sustainable and viable next please so this is uh, the way forward and last two slides are which i am sure will be developed by later speakers in more detail the major decisions were to enhance seed availability and multiple number of seed banks would be taken up in maritime states and for key species promoting indigenous species is an impo important area like native species like gracilaria gracilaria edulis gelidelia acarasa or sargassum etc permission for natural collection from coastal waters and then support intensive convergence this is very important because we have been we felt that each of them are doing their bit in their own silos we need to converge it work, let them work together network them and this is what we are doing under this so this is a national initiative and everybody is is uh, adding uh, and adding to the uh, whole effort next please the, the last slide tells you about the action towards you know there are issues uh, which we are looking at it and uh, enhancing training and capacity building popularizing seaweed based products is very important so feasibility of that in various areas whether it is in uh, you know human consumption or nutraceuticals variety of things can be put to use development of seaweed farming in island <laughs> territories of uh, lakshadweep and uh, andamans and nicobar 
is being looked at. Entrepreneurship in seaweed farming, which is the what we are discussing today, uh, uh, we are asking uh, states to identify such entrepreneurs and support them with technical and financial resources. And this will be also funded through the, the Department of Fisheries and the NFDB. And support to industries, the MSME ministry also will support this. So if you see the whole ecosystem is what we are targeting. And we are hoping that all this will add up to what we are targeting in terms of production, in terms of employment generation. And this is something which we all feel will uh, take us forward. So I will now like to end here because of the uh, time constraint. And I hope that this uh, webinar and the detailed discussion that on each aspect of uh, uh, the issue will be discussed in the uh, forthcoming by the speakers. And that will be very useful for all of us to take it forward. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, NCDC for taking the initiative. And uh, uh, we'll be uh, discussing this issue off and on again and ensuring that uh, the, the target set for us, the kind of vision that we have for development is uh, realized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv uh, Ranjan, sir. Uh, it is uh, really uh, good that you have outlined how the federal government is pushing seaweed uh, in India. Uh, and we have uh, with us uh, the Ministry of uh, Food Processing Industries uh, Additional Secretary, our dear friend, Mr. Manoj Joshi. I'll request him to uh, speak on this occasion because we have a uh, large number of industry participants from uh, India and abroad. So uh, I request uh, Mr. Manoj Joshi. Thank you, Mr. Nayak. And uh, yeah, good morning to all of you. It was wonderful listening to Mr. Raji Ranjan explaining about uh, what they are doing in the seaweed cultivation and uh, uh, promoting cultivation. And our ministry and our schemes come in right after where they leave. And I think unless the way he explained, unless uh, it is taken in an integrated way, uh, it's difficult to develop, which has happened for a lot of sectors in India. Uh, we either promoted the cultivation part, but uh, did not bother so much about processing and marketing and uh, left the farmers or producers uh, in, a, in a problem. So I think that uh, is something we need to really avoid in seaweed cultivation because we are, we are close to nothing at present and want to grow big. So we really need to work in few clusters uh, to begin with, where we also develop uh, processing and marketing along with uh, the cultivation. And uh, we have a scheme called the PM uh, Formalization of Micro Enterprises Scheme, which fits uh, really well into uh, the, what uh, has been outlined by Mr. Rajiv Ranjan for seaweed cultivation. We provide uh, uh, support uh, with a 35% subsidy with the rest coming as a bank loan to individual entrepreneurs, uh, to self-help groups, to cooperatives, to farmer producer organizations, to uh, set up common processing facilities or incubation centers, support for marketing. Uh, all of that is part of our PMFME scheme. So say for individual enterprises, we provide a, a subsidy for micro enterprises, which are less than a, a 200,000 uh, US dollar turnover or about one crore rupees turn, uh, investment. So it's we are very small enterprises. So we provide 35% subsidy limited to uh, 10 lakh rupees uh, or 1 million rupees. Uh, while there's no such limit for SNGs or cooperatives or farmer producer organizations. So we do provide 35% grant for them and uh, with a bank loan linkage. So it should help uh, a lot of uh, these groups. Similarly, we provide some small grant for working capital for uh, self-help group members also, and could set up uh, incubation centers or common processing facilities in the areas which uh, Ministry of Fisheries or NCDC identify for uh, um, seaweed uh, cultivation and processing. So we also are tying up with a lot of research institutions on various parts of food processing industry. So in seaweed cultivation, if uh, Ministry of Fisheries and NCDC have tied up already with research institutions, we would try to right, get into that and provide support. Uh, 
yeah the market uh, is pretty large but yeah cultivation is a problem in india uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, one area for marketing tie up also we can work with uh, ncbc and uh, uh, various groups to support uh, for marketing with the retail chains and with the developing a, a brand or a good packaging and uh, uh, other things so they also provide a lot of support but yeah we probably considering the level of uh, seaweed cultivation in india probably we need to identify few pockets uh, say to begin with five ten pockets and focus on that if we spread our energy too much into various areas probably uh, it, the result would be as good so uh, if uh, ministry of fisheries can guide us as well as to ncdc to focus say five or 10 areas and we really uh, make them as a success stories uh, i think that's what works so if there are few people where they make good money i think a lot of other people follow uh, but if they lose money um, then it uh, doesn't grow that fast so making few success stories uh, with cultivation along with processing and marketing and packaging uh, as a package we work it out it would really work well and we are working with uh, in all the states in all the southern coastal states where uh, this opportunity is there so we would be there to support uh, ministry of fisheries and ncdc in this endeavor and cooperatives by very nature in this is fits really well uh, because um, uh, a large number of uh, small people involved and uh, a common some sort of a common processing facility is required so we have a mou with ncbc to work on such cooperatives and uh, uh, seaweed cultivation and processing could be one of the focus areas in that and i really thank mr sandeep nayak to uh, and the fisheries ministry to have organized this meeting and uh, given an opportunity to focus on an area which is a very niche area and uh, uh, somehow we are not we didn't really focus on this in india though uh, large potential exists uh, in terms of production and market uh, i i will stop here and uh, thank uh, uh, ncdc and ministry of fisheries thank you very much uh, thank you uh, mr joshi uh, i have a, a special request to uh, dr shopin uh dr avasthi uh, wants to speak just to the, for 5 minutes now uh, can i with your permission dr shopin can i re, uh, request dr avasthi to speak uh, for 5 minutes yes yeah, sure yeah uh, dr avasthi sir kindly uh, come in um, uh, to speak about the market linkage of the seaweed uh, products uh, maybe for 5 minutes thank you thank you very much uh, nag sahab uh, mr chairman distinguished participant parts and uh, distinguished speaker thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on it you see about 5 year back we started looking in our country the importance of seaweed and ex use in agriculture especially as a biostimulant and uh, we came across uh, the csi and csm sarai bhavnagar has already patented the product and that patented product is being uh, used and as a biostimulant for the crop which carries 11 to 13% uh, increase in the yield and we observed that aquagri is one company which is in this uh, field but uh, they have had some limitations so we decided to join them and become their 50% partner in aquagri and since then i can tell you that uh, the journey has been smooth it has really taken off very well by the former and um, it has um, created such a increase in the yield that the the farmers are very willingly buying both uh, seaweed as liquid uh biostimulant and also as uh, granules which uh, we are doing with the with a phosphor calcium gypsum uh, which also carries calcium with it so it provides additional support to agriculture what i was trying to say is that as a industry and as a farmer organization ifco is fully owned by the farmer we have 
40 million as former as our members, 37,000 cooperatives are our members. So we have a long reach in the country into far and all corners of the country. So we had that advantage and Aquagri had the advantage of doing additional research and providing the, um, giving adequate compensation to the farmers to, to, to do the seaweed cultivation. The sellable product uh, which we are selling has 20% seaweed extracts, uh, which contains carbohydrates, inorganic salt, and other inherent nutrients like vitamins, plant growth, regulators like auxin, cytokinin, and dibranilin, betans, betans manitol, etc. And uh, it contains a natural and organic origin both. I also must take this opportunity to thank the government of India for launching these products and uh, especially the minister, the prime minister's uh, vision of uh, developing this sector, sector has been very useful to the fishermen as well as the farmer. And uh, especially minister and the secretary, honorable secretary, federal secretary, Dr. Rajiv Ranjan, they together went to Aquagri plant recently and interacted with the farmers and also saw the manufacturing facility and I'm very happy to say this, that now we are going to expand the production capacity in those plants. The advantage of uh, biostimulants, a lot of speakers are there, but I would say uh, we have observed this safe and eco-friendly, no phototoxic effect have been observed in agriculture. Access metabolic enhancer is stimulus crop growth and development. It provides higher crop yield. We have observed crop yield going up by 8% to 15%, enhance physiological efficiency, improve quality. That's very important because the crop quality, when it improves, it improves the, the keeping quality of the product. Enhances stress tolerability because then you, you the, even if there's a flood or a drought, it has the capacity to withstand that stress. And both the liquid and granular form have become very, very, I would say, extremely liked by the farmer and become very popular. And um, it is different doses where it can be done. And uh, I think I will leave it to Dr. Abhiram said to, to take up those matters more in detail. Uh, since I have just five minutes, I thought I'll just mention to it that it's a kind of collaboration which is starts from the producer to the consumer and goes through the industry, through the cooperatives, directly to the farmer's field. These are the unique way by which I think we can make these, pro these kind of product successful in the country. I must take this opportunity to thank again NAXAB for giving me opportunity to present my point of view and thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Avasti. He, uh, Dr. Avasti leads the largest uh, cooperative in the world, uh, not in India, but uh, in the world. Uh, just uh, been uh, evaluated by World Cooperative Monitor. It is the number one cooperative in the world among the top 300. Congratulations, Dr. Avasti, for leading such a big organization. Uh, now I request uh, our uh, uh, coordinator of the webinar, uh, Professor Salin, to take over. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sandeep Naikji. Uh, and today, I think uh, we have seen the background of the webinar because uh, the the backdrop uh, and the big potential. And we have a big uh, big man behind the CV development for several years. And Professor Thierry Chopin, he's a professor at the University of New Brunswick in Canada. And... Uh, he has so many years of experience integrating seaweed in the aquaculture systems and highlighted the potential uh, uh, and uh, with a global reach. And uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Thierry Chopin. Uh, please uh, uh, give, a, uh, give your, uh, maybe you can introduce a bit of the research work and the extension work that you're doing. 
and uh, please share the presentation. Okay. 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 Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's almost uh, two o'clock in the morning on the east coast of Canada. Uh, so I will st uh, try to stay awake. Uh, so what I would like to do uh, for this morning is to talk about seaweeds, but from a different uh, angle. I would like to talk about seaweed as a key component of integrated multitrophic aquaculture, or IMTA, uh, which are providing important ecosystem services and we should put a value on these ecosystem services. Uh, so, um, oh. It seems that um, I don't have the control of. Uh... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, there is presently a renewed uh, interest in seaweed mariculture, which has been triggered by uh, their cultivation in integrated multitrophic aquaculture or IMTS system. Um, the emerging understanding of the ecosystem services they provide and the development of novel use and applications. So I would like to explain a little what is integrated multitrophic aquaculture. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have the control. Okay, we, we try. So initially we thought integrated multitrophic aquaculture was made of three components. The fed aquaculture uh, component with fin fish on two extractive aquaculture components with uh, the organic suspension extractive uh, component with shellfish on the inorganic component with seaweeds. And the way it works is, um, wow, I don't know, it seems I have to push the button many times. Do, do I have the control yeah, you can, or? You can, uh, uh, yeah, you can en try enter the button every time. So it works the, the okay. instruction will come, yeah. Okay, so when, um, but do you have control or do I have control? Sir, it is being controlled from here, sir. Pardon me? I am controlling here from here, sir. Oh, I cannot control? Uh, no, sir. Uh, you, you you can uh, tell next, next. So uh, the, the Nikhil, uh, Mr. Nikhil will do it. You, you just to tell next. Okay. So uh, anyway, when, when you add nutrients to the systems that create a nutrient zone, and you can see that there is different uh, element. Um, the small uh, particulate organic matter that doesn't go very far. So you need to put your shellfish quite close. Then you have the dissolved inorganic uh, nutrient like uh, nitrogen, uh, dissolved phosphorus, dissolved carbon, next. Next. Okay, so the dissolved inorganic nutrient. Oh my God, what's no? So I can I cannot control it from my Even side. The, directly you have to share. Yeah, I have shared from here. Next, next, But you you disable participant screen sharing. Can can I uh, I have the screen sharing? Okay, I, I'm stopping here. Uh, you can start. You can share your screen now.
but you have disabled my, you have to able me to participate. You can share that. Can you try? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so, sorry about that. So um, we were at, yes. Okay, here we are. Um, so we were at dissolving organic nutrients. They uh, move further away. So you need to put your seaweeds uh, not as close uh, as um, the shellfish from the fish. And also we realized there are two other components. You have the large particulate organic uh, material that go uh, faster to the bottom. And when you have a lot of shellfish, they also release uh, feces and pseudo feces, and that also go to the bottom. So you need what we call the deposit extractive aquaculture component made of invertebrates like uh, sea urchin, sea cucumbers, lobsters. And the fifth component, uh, and in general, in marine biology, we don't know much about it, but it's an important one. Uh, it's a mineralizing aquaculture component with microbes, bacteria. And all these activity at the bottom, this bioturbation regenerate more dissolving organic nutrients, which are available uh, to the seaweed. So uh, here it's uh, the full IMTA uh, system. You don't have to have always the five uh, components. You can have two, three components, uh, five if you can. Um, but definitely we want to spend more time here today on the uh, inorganic component of IMTA, the, the seaweeds. And you can see here, uh, we are cultivating uh, kelps in the Bay of Fondi, uh, Eastern Canada. So until now, uh, seaweeds, yeah, okay. Until now, seaweeds uh, uh, and other extractive species have been valued only for their biomass and food trading values. But we have to change uh, our approach. We also need to value them for the ecosystem services they provide along with the increase in consumer trust and societal and political license to operate that they give to the aquaculture industry and that within a circular economy uh, framework. Uh, so what are these ecosystem services provided by seaweeds? Uh, first one is, uh, we just mentioned, seaweeds are excellent nutrient scrubber, especially of diesel, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. Uh, and also what is important with IMTA, you don't need to add fertilizer, you don't need to add agrochemicals because the fed component, the fish, are providing the fertilization. Um, but uh, for that, we will have also to change um, our uh, way of thinking because so far we have always been talking about nutrient as waste and byproduct but now we should consider them as co-product from one species, which can be used as recovered fertilizer and feed resources and also energy for other species, which then become additional crop providing economic diversification while the bioremediation of the coastal nutrification is taking place. So this idea is we have to change of, instead of calling waste, it's just we all know what is waste for somebody is gold for somebody else. What is waste for one species is very uh, good opportunity for another species. Uh, also something that is <laughs> very, almost too obvious, but it's important. Seaweeds do not need to be irrigated. Uh, seaweeds are already in the water. So at the present time, when water is, is becoming such an issue in different parts of the world, uh, not having to irrigate field of seaweed is important. Uh, you don't need more arable soil and land transformation. You don't need deforestation. <coughs> and seaweed can also be used for habitat uh, restoration. Uh, seaweed also in an aquaculture system, are the components that provide oxygen, while the other animal and microbial component 
consume oxygen. And also seaweed can sequester carbon dioxide. I put sequester in quotation mark because it's not sequestering at le, uh, geological scale, but it's uh, sequestering temporary uh, until there is another use. But temporarily, they can, the seaweed can contribute to uh, slowing down global warming. They can also, by sequestering carbon dioxide, contribute to reducing coastal acidification. I much prefer to talk about coastal acidification instead of ocean acidification. I don't think we will never be able in India, in uh, uh, the Philippines, in um, uh, China, and in Canada, enough seaweeds to change the pH of an entire oceans. But at the coastal level, we can have an impact. And how does it work? Is, um, uh, when we have uh, carbon dioxide in the uh, plus water, plus the carbonate, the problem is uh, form bicarbonates, and these bicarbonates are not av available for the shellfish on the coral reef uh, to uh, develop. Uh, and that's a big problem we have at the present time. But in good old chemistry, if you reduce an element like uh, CO2, the uh, equilibrium should be reversed. And as a matter of fact, bicarbonate should go back to carbonate, and carbonates are then uh, bioavailable to shellfish to make their shelf and coal uh, to go uh, more coal reefs. So that's what we have to do, and seaweed can play a role in coastal acidification. Uh, from an economic perspective also, uh, the IMTA multi-crop diversification approach, when you are growing fish on seaweed, on invertebrates, I think it could be an economic risk mitigation on a management option to address pending climate change on coastal acidification impact, and which means that you will increase the resilience of the aquaculture sector. Basically, it's, uh, uh, this diversification is well known. Uh, in agriculture, you should diversify. Uh, on the stock exchange, you should diversify. Well, in aquaculture, you should also diversify. And that's what I said to the salmon grower here. Uh, the big aquaculture um, sector in Eastern Canada is, uh, is salmon. And I told them, please don't put all your salmon eggs in the same basket. That's exactly what we have to do in aquaculture. Uh, we have also to look at um, seaweed in terms of increasing the societal and uh, the political license to operate. Um, like, for example, if we combine uh, seaweed cultivation and wind farm uh, in kind of integrated food and renewable energy park, at the same time, these two activities, by combining their effort, can reduce their cumulative footprint uh, and I think that would be important to get more societal acceptance of both activities, the wind farm and aquaculture. So uh, the value of these important services to the environment and consequently to the society are, however, never accounted for in any budget sheet, in any business plans of seaweed farm and seaweed company. Because again, the seaweeds are being valued only for their biomass and food trading value. But let's uh, try to give a value to these services. Let's try to calculate the economic value of just the nutrient bioremediation. I cited many uh, ecosystem services, but let's focus on one, the bioremediation services provided by the total world aquaculture production. Uh, so we will have to look at the value of these ecosystem services. First, they will have to be recognized. Secondly, they will have to be given a value accounted for, and hopefully when we have done that, we will be able to use them as financial and regulatory incentive tools. So if we look at the seaweed industry uh, uh, in the world, it's uh, 32.4 uh, million tons. It's worth 13.3 billions. Uh, if I look at the average composition, uh, of seaweed, it's 0.35% nitrogen, 0.04% phosphorus, and 3% carbon. And if I look at how much it costs, uh, for example, in a wastewater treatment facility to remove this nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon, for nitrogen, it's around 10 to 30 uh, US dollars per kilo. 
For phosphorus, it's around $4 per kilo. And for carbon, it's around 25, 30 US dollar but per ton. That's very important. Nitrogen and phosphorus, that's per kilo. Uh, uh, for carbon, it's per ton. So there is a factor 1,000 here. Um, keep that in mind. I will come back to it uh, in a few minutes. So if I do the calculation, the ecosystem services of the entire seaweed aquaculture uh, production is at least between 1.2 billion to 3.4 billion uh, dollars, US dollar, which is compared to the 13.3 billion, as much as 26.2% of their present commercial value. And that is never reported in any uh, business plan uh, from any company, and it's never recognized also by governments as uh, uh, doing ecosy ecosystem services for society. So it's about time we develop a system of nutrient trading credits. Um, and uh, I talk about nutrient trading credits because a lot of people talk about carbon, carbon, carbon tax, carbon credit. Everything is about carbon. But as a matter of fact, I would like to bring to your attention that uh, you can make much more money with nutrient trading credits than with carbon trading credit. If we do the calculation for nitrogen, it's between 1.1 and 3.4 billion US dollar. Phosphorus is around 51.8 million. Carbon is only 29.15 million. And that's because of carbon, the value of the tax or the credit was per ton, not per kilo. So as a matter of fact, we spend a lot of time talking about carbon, carbon, carbon. We should spend more time talking about nitrogen and phosphorus in the coastal environment. So we need to recognize this NTC and uh, that will be very important to give a fair price to seaweed on extractive aquaculture, but we need to uh, consider if we want the true value of seaweed aquaculture, we need to consider and give a value to these uh, ecosystem services. Uh, then, then they could be used as financial and regulatory incentive tools to encourage single species aquaculturists to contemplate innovative practices such as IMTA as a viable option to their current practices. So hopefully that will lead to change aquaculture practices. But IMTA is more than a story of nutrient. Uh, on sea weeds are more than seafood. And really what we have to wonder is what do we do with all these seaweeds that we are cultivating in different parts of the world? Uh, and again, we will need to change our attitude, our business model, uh, because so far it's a linear approach, is one species, one process, one product, as we have done so often with fisheries and aquaculture product. But we have to change our approach and move toward integrated sequential biorefinery, where we have one species, several processes, several products. And again, no more byproducts that way, but co product and we are back to think in terms of circular economy. So how does integrated sequential biorefinery works? We have the biomass, we harvest, the watering, pretreatment, transportation, everything uh, go to the biorefinery, a big black box, but you know, a lot of black box generally are red or uh, orange. So that's why my black box is that color. Uh, separation, fractionation, sequential processing. And basically we got two types of product. We get the bio-based high value molecule uh, on the low value commodity energy carrying molecule. The high value molecules, uh, generally the, the price is good, but the volume is not necessarily that big uh, because of the different market compared to the low value commodity like biofuel and everything. Uh, but generally the price per ton is very low. So as a matter of fact, we have to decide what we want to produce. It's a compromise between the price you can get and the volume you can sell. So because uh, uh, the market on the added value of seaweed product vary uh, extremely. If we look at the value, the volume, uh, the biofuel, biodiesel, biogas, bioalcohol, it's less than $1 per kilo. 
And frankly, um, I am not interested in developing so much seaweed for biofuel. I cannot produce my seaweed for less than one dollar a kilo. So I am more interested in more lucrative uh, product, biomaterial, biocomposite, and adhesive. Uh, it's a developing market. We don't know exactly what could be the price. When you talk about agrochemicals, biopolymers, animal feed, it's between one and twenty dollars per kilo. Uh, fine chemicals, ingredient, human food, it's a, already a better price between twenty and two hundred dollars per kilo. Neutraceutical, cosmeceutical, five hundred to one thousand dollars per kilo on the best price you can get, but it's very small market. It's the pharmaceutical, the bioactive, which you can sell uh, for more than $1,000 a kilo. But uh, again, the tonnage is not that uh, big. So again, it's a, you see my picture is like a kind of pyramids. Um, it's a, a you have to think, okay, what uh, seaweed do I want to cultivate? How easy it is to cultivate? What is my market? Uh, what will be my volume of sales? And then you decide what is the best compromise in your case. So I would say to conclude that in recent conferences, a lot of people talk about blue growth, blue economy, blue revolution. Uh, however, we should also recognize that it's need to become greener. So when you combine blue and green together, it's about time we talk about the turquoise growth, the turquoise economy, the turquoise revolution, because frankly, how many times is the water that blue? And uh, not so many times, a lot of time, the water is uh, turquoise, uh, a mixture of green and blue. And on that, I will say thank you very much. And if my Hindi is approximately correct, I will say Hapka Baut Baut Danyavad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Chopin. That is a very interesting uh, concept that you have put forward. Uh, to move towards a circular economy that is more based on nutrient trading credits and uh, highlighting the the ecosystem services that seaweeds present and and contribute to the circular economy so uh, may I ask uh, Sandeep Kumar Naikji to to invite uh, Ms. Blossom Kochar uh, thank you, Professor uh, Salin. Uh, uh, it's indeed a great uh, pleasure for me to uh, invite uh, Dr. Blashan Kosha. Um, when I spoke to her a couple of days back uh, uh, to uh, speak on this uh, webinar, uh, she was extremely happy. And um, uh, uh, this is an occasion where uh, I have to highlight that uh, she comes with uh, several decades of uh, experience in working in the industry. And she holds a double doctorate in aromatherapy. Uh, she manufactures her own range of aromatherapy-based beauty products under the brand name Blossom Crusher Aroma Magic. And uh, she uses uh, seaweeds to a uh, um, uh, great uh, perfection and adding value. Uh, in fact, I must mention here that NCDC is uh, with the uh, support of the Department of Fisheries, Government of India, and also the Association of NEDAC would like to set up a, an incubation center where industry and uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, 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 their connection with the young uh, graduates and things like that ex across India will be set up. We look forward to working with you, Dr. Blushan Kocha, in the future pleasure. also. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Blushan. Thank you. Thank you. I just like to put this like this. Okay. So good, good, uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. And it's a real pleasure to be here and to and to listen to this, uh, you know, this wonderful talk. And I would really like to thank to congratulate. Uh, 
the Mr. Sandeep and the organizations and NCDC and of course the fisheries and the other organizations for holding the seminar. I think it is very, very important at this stage. And I'm going to talk since, since I've been manufacturing and into cosmetics for a long time, not only cosmetics, beauty, spa, wellness, we have been using, of course, a lot of natural products and organic products and also seaweed to a certain extent. And I'd like to just tell you a story how I got into seaweed. Like I was visiting Chennai, I remember, and I found we were doing cosmetics with other natural ingredients. And I visited Chennai and we were by the sea and I found these ladies working on the seaweed. And when I looked at their hands, their hands were flawless. They were a wonderful coloring. They had a wonderful coloring. There was no aging. So that got me thinking there must be something in this seaweed because the others, their hands had a problem. They had pigmentation on the hands of other people. And here there was no pigmentation. The hands and the older ladies, their hands were beautiful. So I said, there must be something in this seaweed. So let's look and in, look into it. And of course, when I went into it, I found that, you know, they have a lot of proteins. They have a lot of polysaturates, saccharides. They have fatty acids. They have amino acids. And they also have these primary and this thing, they have pigments, they have vitamins, sterols, and other biochemical agents in them. So I said, this is fantastic. Now let's see how it is going to work in my product. And so, and of course, the other thing I found, it's natural and it works with essential oils be like because of the smell. So, you know, nobody would like a fishy smell so much. So when we use the essential oils along with it, it was really fantastic and gave a really wonderful effect. So we found that, of course, we could, I used it in, how I used it, I used it for like, you know, for photo, like in sunscreens, because it has excellent photo protection. Then I used it in hyperpigmentation, because that was where I saw these women's hands. And I found that it has the thing called tyro, tyrosin, that really it, it's an inhibitor. They have an inhibitors in that. So it stops this melanin from forming, which was very, very good and wonderful. The best, and of course, antioxidant, it has these wonderful antioxidant properties. And the best thing I found, it has anti-aging properties, which is fantastic. It has these peptides in them. It brightens the skin. It has hyaluric acid, which is really very, very good. And it also, you know, has the cell rejuvenation which is wonderful. So a lot of my things like the firming product of mine, which I use called a firming gel, which we put on and then we use a machine called, you know, a galvanic machine. And in three minutes, you can have a lift and you'll find the lady will look about five to 10 years younger with that, which was really amazing. And I still use it. A lot of my packs now, because of the whitening agent in it, the thing, lightning agent, the thing, we use it with vitamin C. So it, and these, these seaweeds themselves, as you all will know, the scientists and things, they have the vitamin C, they have A, E, and they have B complex also. Which, so it is wonderful for the skin because I really believe that what you put on your skin, you should be able to eat and what you eat, you should be able to put on your skin. And that is what is going to make a, real, a lady or anyone, whether it's a gent or a lady, anyone really good. It also has phenols, uh, you know, prop propylene phenols, which is wonderful for this high, con it has a high concentration of that. And so that helps the anti-aging of the skin. So that is good. And it has a very excellent moisturizing effect. So, you know, it could be used as a gel. And also, of course, we mix it with essential oils of neroli and sandalwood, which gives it that wonderful, you know, moisturizing effect. And we say, put it on overnight and sleep like an overnight pack. And you will find that 
the skin will get beautifully hydrated because of this uh, high oleic effect. And it's really wonderful that we've been working with these products for a long time. And I find that it helps the skin a great deal. And really, I, I know abroad, we have a lot of firms that have been doing this. In India, it is not, it, you know, it is still in its nascent stage. And I think if we can take it forward and really give, show the benefits and give the benefits of these or of these, of the seaweed, it could really become something that is going to go forward. And I feel with all this that's happening with the government that's coming in and with everyone that's working with it. And of course, with the NCDC, I feel this could really become a big thing because once everybody know how to use it, and of course we use the bioactives of it. So how to use it, how to use the bioactives, how to go into it, it was, it's going to become a wonderful thing because it helps the skin, it helps the hair. Let's not just talk about the skin. The hair is also a big part. It helps in falling hair, which is wonderful. It helps in keeping your hair, the dry hair, you know, really good and moist. So it works wonderful. And I feel there is a huge future of this of the uh, of seaweed cosmetics in India and I think all over the world where they are going through because this is natural and now everyone are going to natural and it and organic and I think there could be nothing better than this. So I think we love we should take this forward and go ahead forward. And Mr. Sandeep, I'd love to work with your organization and see how we can go with it. And of course, get more people into this cosmetics and making it so that it can really become something. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krocha. Thank you for uh, uh, sharing your ideas and thoughts. We have a great future uh, ahead working with each other for the uh, cooperatives for the farmers and the community which are involved in seaweeds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now uh, request uh, uh, Mr. Aviram Seth uh, from Aqua Agri. He is one of the early pioneers in. Uh, uh, in the seaweed industry. Uh, he is the managing director of Equa Agri. Uh, he is doing a great job in uh, the coastal areas and uh, improving the uh, livelihoods of uh, uh, people in the coastal areas. Particularly, he is working with the self-help groups, our honorable minister, federal minister of Indian uh, Fisheries Department. He visited as the secretary told uh, in his uh, speech. He's, uh, he was initially working with uh, PepsiCo and PepsiCo had a project with the seaweeds uh, and uh, working in water management and waste mm -hmm. disposal. He has uh, uh, proved that uh, the seaweeds can be a very mm -hmm. viable business and with the partnership of the largest cooperative of the world, IFCO, he has proved it. Welcome, uh, Mr. Sait. Uh, and to share your ideas and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Naik Sahib. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be presenting uh, my work here. And I am delighted that cooperative sector has uh, now taken interest in cultivation and the way we saw a turning point in our business, once uh, we partnered with IFCO, I'm pretty sure once the cultivation activity is taken up by cooperative sector, it will see the same kind of a growth trajectory as we have seen for our business. So I'll just share the importance of seaweed cultivation uh, has been recognized uh, by the leaders of our country. Our Prime Minister at multiple occasions 
has been encouraging the scientific community to promote seaweed cultivation. Its importance was equally recognized by late Dr. Kalam also. Basically, if you look at the key features of seaweed industry, it is a extremely viable model for all the stakeholders. If you look at the cultivators, it provides an opportunity for people who don't have any land holding with limited amount of investment, which in today's circumstances with various government schemes can easily be made available for people to take up this as a livelihood initiative without disturbing or relocating them from their local habitat and particularly women can take up this activity, which gives them an income which is significantly higher than what the minimum wages are provide them. One second. Into another part which was already covered by Dr. Chopin was that it sequesters nutrients which wash down into the sea, at least in the coastal areas. It sequesters carbon and mitigate the impact, adverse impact of climate change. Its products are used by multiple uh, industries and seaweed based biostimulants provide crop resistance against abiotic steps and boost productivity. And now, based on the latest work which has been done by the science system, we believe the next big opportunity is in the area of animal nutrition. And uh, we are very excited on embarking upon this dimension. This was the video which I am told will be played at the end of the presentation. Basically, if you look at the domain and which was pointed out by the earlier speaker that you can move in a range of products from low value to high value. Uh, you can produce hydrocolloids. That's the way we began our journey. Then we went into biostimulants and are now looking at animal nutrition and going forward would branch out into organic chemicals and nutraceuticals and have done some fair degree of work in developing edible packaging options. Basically, we had in the last 10, 12 years, we have been working on it. We have had ups and downs, but after we joined hands with IFCO, the business has only been on the way up and the product is really being widely accepted by the farmers and as we speak we are expanding our agriculture products range going forward we partnered with the science system under the nimitly scheme and have validated formulations for application of seaweed formulations, both for cattle and poultry. And the great part is in today's times, it has been conclusively demonstrated that the immune modulation response, both in cattle and poultry, has a significant improvement if they are given small quantities of seaweed formulations added to their diet. We are also now in the second stage of developing higher range of value added food solutions made out of carrageenan because industry actually looks for a ready-made solution which provides certain properties in their food products range. They are not really looking for uh, plain vanilla carrageenan with or the simple hydrocolloids. If you look at the 
our performance versus national and international benchmarks, the secretary clearly pointed out that in this large sector, we have an insignificant presence, but under the goals which have been set by the fisheries ministry, we have long way to travel in the next five years. And uh, opportunity in this domain can be seen by the fact that seaweed industry based biostimulants industry is about 2200 crores, which is likely to grow to 8,000 crores, over 8,000 crores by 2030. But 75% of the seaweed based biostimulants sold in India are imported from North America and Europe. Given our large coastline, it, this is clearly a great opportunity for our Nirbhar Bharat. Now, you know, it's very good to have clearly defined targets, but I think there are certain steps which are very, very critical, which we must take to ensure that we achieve what we are setting out to do. First is, we need to ensure continuous availability of high quality planting material for the cultivators. Towards this end, we need to establish a, it can't be done under a project mode. It has to be done on a corporate mode. And we believe setting up a section 25 public private partnership company, leveraging the fisheries department, the ICIR and CSIR institutions, particularly CMFRI, and CSMCRI, this could be an area which could be easily achieved. We are already working with CSMCRI towards this end. And Dr. Nanisha, who's going to be speaking later in the webinar, has, is providing technical know-how for this initiative. We need to, you know, we have heard a lot about the beneficial impact of seaweed cultivation. In India, we still are not allowed to do it in uh, Gulf areas because of some concerns expressed by the Ministry of uh, Environment. But today, we are happy to say pilots are expected to start shortly, jointly being run by CSMCRI, CMFRI, and NCSCM to evaluate its impact. And I'm pretty sure this will open the path for rapid expansion in the Gulf areas. Important, other important aspect is we need to get varietal diversification. And though there are three major areas open for cultivation, which can be cultivated in tropical areas, the species, we need to also get spinosim, which is another good contender for being cultivated in our coastal waters. We need to continue work with the scientific institutions by leveraging the available science to improve the viability of our cultivars going forward. We need to have cultivation models for land-based cultivation a lot of work has gone on in this area and we need to move further on it and enlarge the scope of creating products as the speakers have pointed out for human nutri nutrition for which investment in some research is needed. Seaweed site mapping and pilot study has already been undertaken and now we need to do pilots in these areas to, dis to determine their viability. We also need to put in a discipline in collection sites and identify and enlarge the collection sites for seaweed in other domains so that the biomass availability can be improved for the industry. There's also an opportunity to do deep sea cultivation and for this infrastructure for pilots can be funded by the fisheries department under the scheme announced by them so that we could get higher growths because in these areas there is higher water motion and better nutrient exchange. 
and we need to leverage the cooperative network and model for propelling the growth of seaweed cultivation. We need to encourage and support adoption of seaweed-based nutrients in dairy, poultry, fish, to improve their immunity, reduce mortality, and increase productivity. You know, hydrocolloids is a very big industry, but they're largely focused on Western solutions. They can actually be used very effectively for our dairy products and confectionaries, whereby you can reduce the fat content and improve the productivity. And this is an area which our science system should take up on priority. We also need to work on food fortification using seaweeds, which are acceptable and useful for Indian palate. This is all I had to share. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sait. Uh, uh, you have uh, really uh, added the dimension of uh, the future of research and where we can move uh, for bringing better value to the industry in the Indian context. Uh, and also you have uh, pointed out uh, how successful you have been in partnering with our premier scientific institutions. We have also in this panel, you might have seen the premium scientific institutions of Vietnam, uh, Philippines, apart from uh, Canada, which Dr. Terry Chopin has already uh, spoken. Now it is my privilege to uh, welcome uh, uh, Ms. Kavita Nehemia of SNAP Natural and Alginate India. Uh, Ms. Kavita uh, holds an undergraduate degree in uh, economics from the Stephens College, Delhi, and she has an MBA from Cornell, uh, USA. She has previously worked in the financial services industry for more than 10 years, first with a microfinance company, where her role included designing financial products for Urban Poor and uh, later co-founding a fintech company, where as co-founder, her role scanned multiple functions. At SNAP, she oversees the marketing of agriculture and formulated products, she has also been working with the SSGs. Uh, she has a great interest in the seaweed industry. I request uh, Ms. Kavita uh, to share her uh, ideas and how we can work together to bring prosperity to the farmers. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nayak. It's, uh, it's really an honor uh, for me to have the opportunity to present amongst uh, you know such an esteemed uh, panel and. Uh, uh, and members here. I'm just uh, going to uh, share my screen. So, uh, sorry, I don't think I have access to share it. So if uh, I think uh, if Nikhil could share it, then access is there to you. You are the, one of the co-host in this uh, webinar. Okay. I'm uh, I'm unable to. So if you could just uh, share it, then that would be great. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'll just start by uh, introducing uh, the company very briefly. Uh, so if you can just go to the next uh, page. Um, so we uh, are, our company is uh, more than 40 years old. We were established in 1979. And today we're one of the largest processors of seaweed based products in India. We uh, collect sargassum from natural beds from the coastline at uh, Ramesh, uh, Ramnathpuram. So uh, we collect about 15,000 metric tons of wet weeds per year. And in addition to this, we also do uh, cultivate leukemia in the sea. We have about 500 rafts. 
we have two sites, one uh, site that is near the seashore, which we use for the post-processing of the seaweed, and our 12-acre manufacturing site, which is in uh, Tamil Nadu. Next, please. Uh, so we manufacture um, alginate, which is primarily used in food, uh, pharmaceutical and industrial grade. Uh, caragnin, which we primarily use uh, for food. Uh, we do uh, manufacture specialized blends for the dairy industry. And uh, we also do uh, manufacture biostimulants. Uh, today, I'm going to mostly focus on our work in the food and pharmaceutical since we've had panelists speak about biostimulants and uh, other industries. Uh, next, please. Uh, so we uh, started manufacturing textile grades alginate, but uh, at that time, the main competitor is primarily Chinese material. Uh, we were unable to match the viscosity because the Chinese use laminaria weeds, but uh, sargassum weeds, on the other hand, gives excellent gel strength, which makes it very ideal for food and pharmaceutical industry. Uh, next, please. Um, so the primary use of alginate in pharmaceutical industry and where our clients uh, are some of our prominent clients, so uh, it is used for antacids. So what the alginate does is it creates a, a kind of a gel layer, a raft layer in your stomach so that the acids don't reflux. And alginate is also known to have wound healing properties. Uh, so it's known to heal stomach ulcers. So for example, our product used to be used in Gaviscone, which Reckitt and Benkaiser uh, manufactures and uh, in several other antacids that are manufactured by Dr. Eddy's laboratory. It's also used in Crocin Advanced. So essentially what the alginate enables it to do is a quick action, which enables the fever to reduce much faster. And it also soothes the stomach. We also, it's also used in heart medication where it's used as a sustained release drug. So Abbott uses our product for that. Apart from this, alginate is known to have several wound healing properties. It's used for things like dental impression material, and uh, like Dr. Blossom had uh, mentioned previously, it's used in cosmetics, so in face packs and uh, other cosmetics. Next, please. Uh, coming to the food industry, alginate's usage in food is uh, it's primarily because of uh, because it's a gelling agent. It really binds everything in the food together, so it prevents any separation or settling of any particles. So, for example, Nestle uses our product in ketchup sauces. Uh, Dabur uses it in their real fruit juices. So it essentially prevents any separation of the pulp or the sugar or anything else, and it keeps it binds everything together. Uh, in ice cream, uh, it's uh, the main property is to prevent ice crystal formation, and it's used by various clients. Next, please. Uh, the other industrial grade alginates I won't talk much upon, but it's used in welding electrode in uh, rubber latex and several other industrial uses. Next, please. Uh, Caragnin, which is manufactured from uh, red algae, uh, so this is cultivated in the sea, and uh, this is primarily used in food products. Next, please. So we uh, uh, primarily uh, blend and create special formulations using caragnin, and which is used in the koya and in the dairy industry. So today we make blends for koya, ice cream, milkshake. Uh, cheese and other products like uh, jellies, processed meats, puddings. So the primary primary property of caragnin is really to improve texture, taste, uh, to impart a uniform color and flavor. Caragnin also reduces the protein denature of milk while heating, so it keeps a lot of the uh, nutrient properties intact. Uh, it also does improve the yield because it has a better binding capacity. So internationally, actually, the food industry is the largest consumer of alginate and caragnin. In India, however, uh, we have traditionally used a lot of lower quality ingredients, and it requires a change in mindset to really increase the consumption in the food industry. Next, please. So uh, before I end, I just wanted to spend a, a couple of seconds just talking about the uh, seaweed farming and the impact that it has in the coastal communities. So a lot of the panelists previously have really spoken about the livelihoods and how we, uh, you know, how it really has a huge impact in the coastal communities. Next, please. So I wanted to just give you a brief description of the kind of uh, people who do take up seaweed farming. They are primarily lower literate people 
a lot of them are fisher folk who take up seaweed farming to diversify their livelihood uh, several women uh, several women and ssgs who take up seaweed farming and it is far more profitable than uh, fishing so they do take it up as an alternative livelihood uh, next please so seaweed farming refers to both harvesting from the natural beds which is based uh, it is based on the calendar which is what sargassum and turban area collection is and uh, cultivation in the sea for kappa ficus uh, next please so seaweed farming is a fairly labor intensive process so it generates employment at at every level and again primarily for women so if you look at the fisher folk each boat that goes out to for this collection of seaweed each boat employs about 6 to 8 people and there are several workers who you have to employ for drying cleaning sorting harvesting of the weeds and the earning per day can range between 500 to 700 rupees per day uh so during season for example our company we employ upwards of 2000 people uh during the seasonal month so it is a very profitable activity for them and the coastal communities are uh, they're interested they are happy to do it because it is additional income for them so it is definitely now up to us as uh, industries and for the government to really push this effort so that we can develop the livelihoods of the coastal communities uh thank you that's uh, that's all i had today थैंक यू मिस जस्ट वांटेड डॉक्टर नायक वो वीडियो था जो वेरी यूजफुल पीपल विल गेट ए वेरी गुड आइडिया अबाउट द एक्टिविटी thank you thank you very much uh, thank you ms kavita again uh, now i request prof um, uh, salim to uh, take uh, the privilege of uh, introducing dr nguyen from vietnam yeah thank you chairman uh, yeah we have uh, the next speaker uh, dr nguyen van nguyen he is uh, deputy director of the research institute for marine fisheries in vietnam which is the nodal agency for uh, most of the marine fisheries research uh, and development particularly the seaweed farming so he has a lot of experience working with the ministry of agriculture and rural development in vietnam and most of his research and uh, extension work is with the seaweed research so may I have the privilege to invite uh dr nguyen to take the floor thank you thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this uh, very nice occasion where i uh, can meet many of the people that i know just in the paper before so uh can you see my screen yeah please make it up uh, the slide presentation mode full screen yeah yeah <clears throat> okay so uh Uh, first of all i would like to uh, very brief uh, introduce uh, my uh, institute so uh, we are under the ministry of uh, agriculture and uh, rural development so we are the main uh, advisor of the ministry for uh, uh, 
almost uh, own aspect in uh, fisheries and aquaculture. So uh, fish stock assessment and uh, fishing technology, post harvest uh, technology, uh, bio biodiversity, marine environment, and um, of course aquaculture. So uh, uh, and including uh, seaweed. Uh, let's have some uh, very, very brief information about the uh, natural uh, resource of uh, seaweed in Vietnam. We have some uh, more than uh, 3,000 kilometer of coastline and uh, uh, near um, a lot of uh, islands and uh, river mouth. So we have uh, seaweed flora around uh, 800 species and around uh, 100 uh, species is, uh, uh, of the economic uh, value. And the total biomass uh, estimated to be around uh, nearly uh, 100,000 uh, tons, and mainly sagasim. Uh, regarding the uh, cultivate species, we have uh, uh, seven species at the moment. So uh, three species of Brassilaria, which is in uh, the brackish water, uh, and uh, Capaficus, two species, and the Ikuma, and uh, the Colep. Uh, Colepa is recently uh, captured for, for exports at uh, the seafood. The po total potential uh, area is around uh, nearly um, 30,000 uh, hectare, but this is just a very uh, rough estimate because uh, it, it, it becomes uh, rising because uh, of the, a lot of the water we before we use soft stream, but as you say, it become uh, uh, environment is not good anymore, and it can be turned into the uh, seaweed. And the cultivation is uh, not very much, just uh, around uh, ten thousand hectare, which is uh, much lower than before. Before we have much more than this. Uh, first is for the Karanginu fight. Uh, we have uh, uh, around uh, the potential area is around uh, ten thousand. Uh, at the peak period, around 2007, we have around uh, 1,500 hectare, but then it goes down a lot. And at the moment, it's uh, less than 600 uh, hectare. And, uh, and uh, we have three species, uh, two of the cotton eye and uh, the, uh, one of the spinosum. And the problem, the main problem is uh, 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 the reducing is uh, of the growth rate of the, of the degradation of the seed because all of these are import from uh, the Philippines, thanks to the Philippines. But uh, for a long time, has been a long time we don't import again. So uh, as you see, you can see in the, uh, in the, screen here. Uh, so the growth rate is going down quite a, a lot. Uh, gradually growing down. And uh, at the moment, it's uh, at a very, very low grow, growth rate. And also the, the poor market, because uh, until recently, we don't have um, factory. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, there's one uh, um, uh, one uh, enterprise uh, set up a, a factory. But again, we uh, don't have uh, uh, raw material. So still uh, playing around and they are uh, importing from uh, the material from uh, Indonesia. Oh, sorry, I don't know how, to... oh, okay. And uh, realizing that uh, problem, recently the government of uh, Vietnam, uh, particularly the Ministry of uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, agriculture and rural development, they uh, found quite a lot of uh, a study. And one of that, if you, if you uh, maybe uh, realize, uh, Dr. Reddy, we had uh, a visit to him and he also uh, visit us and they uh, ad advise us and we success in uh, tissue culture of Kapha Bikut and Barazi. And uh, we are heading for applied in, in the wild uh, with the uh, hope that uh, it may restore uh, make uh, the uh, seeds uh, uh, better and uh, we restore the growth rate. Uh, so we success, but unfortunately, uh, 
uh, we get quite a lot of uh, seed and was about to uh, bring it to uh, to farmer and then the flood a serious flood happened and then now we have to start again so uh, it's a, a the, the new seed has been become uh, mixed with uh, the other uh, so we got quite a good uh, result and uh, regarding the uh, Karagin production we um, uh, as I said uh, earlier there's uh, one company they set up on factory with capacity of around 6,000 tons per year, but uh, we don't have raw material. So uh, now they, they are also uh, interested in uh, cooperate with uh, the farmer to, uh, and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture to try to uh, develop the, uh, the area for, uh, for, for raw material and focusing on uh, Kapapikus Adarezi. Uh, for Gracia, we have uh, uh, quite a lot of species, but uh, for cultivated species, we have uh, now mainly three species. Uh, with natural uh, harvest uh, production is around 800 uh, tons per year, and potential area for cultivation is around uh, close to 20,000 hectares. Uh, but as I, uh, but it is before, and uh, we don't have much update uh, in information on this because uh, um, a lot of, uh, of uh, attention is uh, given to stream because uh, Vietnam is uh, become one of the very big uh, stream exporter and uh, it's dominant. Uh, so, uh, but recently uh, we have, uh, as I said before, uh, we have problem with. Uh, um, uh, the environment because uh, uh, the, uh, after a long time of uh, electrification due to the stream, stream culture. So um, you know, a lot of them uh, of the pond has been uh, abandoned and uh, 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 we have to estimate again the, 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 the area. Uh, at the moment, we don't have uh, 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 very good uh, data on the uh, culture, but uh, three species including the Tendu Pipitata in the north, Perma uh, in the central, and uh, the Melina uh, in the central. Uh, so, uh, is, the area used to be a very uh, large uh, uh, sector of the fishery, fishery in Vietnam in, uh, before 2000, but then it's shrinked down because uh, most of the area is converted to uh, uh, stream. So uh, we really hope that now stream become uh, start to have a problem and uh, uh, people, uh, at least uh, the government and uh, many of the uh, farmer now uh, they realize that uh, uh, seaweed is also very uh, important and uh, we come back with uh, uh, seaweed. And uh, for Kolepa, we uh, it's recently introduced to Vietnam and. Uh, uh, at the moment, only just around 80 hectares in the center of Vietnam and uh, around 2,400 tons per year, and mainly export to uh, Japan, large export, uh, fresh uh, export to Japan. So on the screen, you can see the, uh, how they uh, grow in uh, ponds or recently in uh, concrete tank and uh, export to Japan, but also recently Vietnamese start to eat uh, uh, seaweed. So we have a very great potential for domestic uh, market. And remember that the population of Vietnam is 100 million. So uh, once they start to, to uh, use uh, 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 seaweed uh, daily, then uh, we, we, we will have a very big market. And this is how they uh, uh, cultivate and uh, um, uh, clean the uh, seaweed uh, to export to China, uh, to, to Japan. So this is uh, some of the product uh, export to uh, Japan. But now these days you can see uh, seaweed uh, is sold on the street uh, and uh, in, in, in the market. And this is very big change in the, uh, in the behavior of uh, Vietnamese uh, population because I'm uh, also working with seaweed for 20 years and, and 20 years ago, we, we talked to each other of how to introduce the 
uh, the, the custom to eat seaweed into Vietnam population, but this day we don't have to introduce uh, again anymore because of the culture exchange. So uh, this day you, you can you can find quite a lot of uh, Korean, Japanese product and also Vietnamese product in the market and people eat uh, uh, quite a lot. So uh, it's changed quite a lot and huge uh, uh, potential for uh, market domestic market. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, regarding the, the future of uh, uh, seaweed cultivation in Vietnam, uh, recently, as I, 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 I expected before, before we focused quite a lot on shrimp, but now uh, it turned out that uh, we need uh, to diversify, particularly uh, into, to introduce more seaweed into uh, this, uh, in, into aquaculture. Uh, to for sustainable and uh, to balance out uh, the, the environment. Uh, and uh, I can uh, show you some of the, because we, we also uh, work quite a lot with the environment. So uh, all the, as you see in the, in the, in the, in the on the screen, uh, the environment of, in the, in the coastline of Vietnam is eutrophication happen almost everywhere. So you can see from 2005, 2009 here, but I have the update one here. So it come up to 2008, 18, and continue to rise up the nitrogen. So uh, uh, eutrophication, it happened all around the, 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 the coastline. And uh, you can imagine this is the cage culture in Ha Long Bay and they have to aerate also in Vung Tau area, Vung Tau area, it's just in open area in the upper, in the sea, but we have to aerate. So you can see that uh, uh, how it's changed. So uh, this also some more information about uh, uh, how it uh, eutrophication linked with uh, the, 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 the algae, the, the, the phytoplankton. So we, recently we also observed quite a lot of uh, red tide and uh, before 2000, uh, we, I myself working with the red tide and uh, we think that the red tide story is some of somewhat the other country like Japan, Korea, not Vietnam, but this day it happened quite a lot in Vietnam. And these two data show that the, uh, on the left is the uh, uh, phytoplankton count in the Gulf of Thailand. It steadily increased year by year. And this is uh, on the right one, the red one, uh, in it's in Halong Bay, the cell count. You can see that in in, in 2000 and in 2012, it has in, in increased by 65 uh, fold. So uh, it's a, a clear proof of how the environment is changing. And also, this is a uh, image of some of the red tide that we got recently. And also, the other story: that uh, Vietnam is located in the South China Sea is uh, surrounded by developing country and all of them are uh, great country in terms of, uh, uh, of nutrients added into the coastal line. So you can see that um, uh, on the right hand side is the green tide in China and we share the border with uh, China and also some other country in, 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 in the area. And we will see, we see it, it something like the uh, a region that uh, raised in, in pollution, particularly in eutrophication. And uh, what is the government's uh, vision uh, about this? So uh, uh, we, uh, because we are under, uh, directly under the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, so uh, we have uh, quite uh, direct uh, um, uh, advice to the ministry. So it means that to the government, of uh, how to uh, to to uh, to utilize the chance of uh, to balance out to uh, go uh, to 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 use uh, seaweed uh, as a factor for um, for sustainable uh, aquaculture uh, to introduce back uh, uh, and uh, uh, the fact is that the, as 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 said that in the past it's it used to be a very great uh, sector of aquaculture but recently it's uh, replaced by shrimp uh, but uh, shrimp bias approach is uh, will lead to 
uh, unsustainable aquaculture. But uh, seaweed uh, uh, plays in an opposite uh, way uh, because uh, shrimp will add uh, nutrient into the uh, environment. And uh, uh, so uh, seaweed can help the uh, eutrophication, uh, coastal eutrophication problem. Uh, and also it, uh, if we come back to seaweed, we can solve uh, another problem is that salt invasion as uh, if you uh, um, uh, if you um, um, uh, in recently in the Mekong Delta area, we have a serious problem of uh, uh, sea invasion because uh, of the drought, of the damping, or maybe of the sea rising, or maybe all of them uh, in uh, combination. And uh, uh, in some area, they, we cannot uh, cultivate uh, rice anymore. Uh, so uh, the government in intend to uh, convert into uh, aquaculture area. And uh, seaweed is one of the, uh, the highlight uh, subjects that we are heading to. And the second one is uh, the domestic uh, market. As I, 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 I said before, that uh, producing uh, seaweed is not just for export, but also for uh, the domestic uh, uh, market for Vietnamese uh, now. Uh, changing uh, to the behavior to eat uh, more seaweed. And uh, uh, the ac action of the government include various uh, 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 action, including uh, the very recent uh, uh, master plan of aquaculture, they uh, will buy us on the seaweed. So uh, uh, we introduce quite a lot, uh, a lot of uh, uh, intention to introduce uh, back uh, seaweed into the system. And uh, recently we also, uh, uh, the government also support more study on uh, seaweed. Uh, and uh, this is uh, quite uh, changing because uh, uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we, we, we will not uh, have any uh, fund on, on, on that. And they uh, also have many occasions to bring uh, companies, uh, researcher, and uh, policymaker together, and uh, I uh, we really hope that a new era of uh, seaweed uh, uh, motivation will uh, come back uh, uh, in in the few uh, in, in in the coming time. And uh, uh, RIMS, that is our institute, is uh, can be uh, at, at the contact uh, point uh, uh, with uh, 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 company with uh, a foreigner uh, to uh, motivate it. So uh, I mean that uh, the potential for, for seaweed uh, cultivation in Vietnam is quite a lot, but uh, recently it, it's outcompete by stream. But now uh, the government come back with the, the, uh, the, the appro more appropriate uh, approach. So uh, seaweed uh, uh, industry, uh, we hope that uh, there will be uh, quite a lot of change in uh, the coming uh, time. So that's all of the, my uh, share. So uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me my chance to uh, uh, come to uh, this uh, society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ingman. Uh, that's a very interesting presentation on the challenges and the prospects uh, for seaweed business in uh, Vietnam. It's interesting to know most of the Southeast Asian countries, uh, it's a big food commodity but not so much in the South Asia. So really interesting to see both business and food industry developing together. So we have the next speaker, uh, Dr. Anisia Hutado from the Philippines. And uh, Dr. Anisia is a, uh, is a senior scientist. She retired from uh, the Southeast Asian uh, Fisheries Development Center, the CFDEC Aquaculture Division. Uh, and she has a, a, a long career spanning more than 50, 25 years with seaweed research. Uh, after her PhD from the Kyoto University in Japan, uh, most of her research was focused on seaweed uh, in, in the Philippines. And uh, she has a lot of uh, stories to bring. Uh, she's, uh, she has also authored a book devoted to seaweeds industry in the Philippines. And uh, I have the privilege uh, to invite 
Dr. Anis here. Uh, please. Dr. Anisia. Okay, you are still muted. Dr. Anna, uh, you, are, you are muted. Can no, mute? I have a recorded presentation. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, it will be presented from uh, NCDC. Yeah, that's, thank you, yeah. A pleasant afternoon to all. Today, I'll be sharing with everybody some science-based innovations for the sustainability of red seaweed cultivation, Kappa ficus or cotonite in particular. To begin with, global seaweed aquaculture production is led by China, that is mainly for temperate seaweeds like Saccharina, Undaria, and Pyropia followed by Indonesia, at Kapaficus, Yukuma, and Gracilaria, then Korea, which farm seaweeds just like China. The Philippines also farm Kapaficus and Yukuma, but to a lesser extent on Gracilaria. Other countries like Japan, Malaysia, and Tanzania contribute also, but in lesser volume. Yukuma denticulatum the Spanish Yukuma is produced in small volume, ranging from 84,000 to 274,000, reaching its peak in 2015. It can be gleaned farther from the table that Yukuma SPP reached its highest volume in 2015, that is 10.189 million, but declined in the following three years. It should be noted that Yukuma was the first genus name of Kapaficus until 1988, when it was identified as a distinct and separate genus from Kapaficus. Today, there are two major commercial species of Kapaficus. These are Alvarezai and Striatus. Hence, I would say that Yukumas pp and Kapaficus alvarezai must be birds as Kapaficus spp which are entirely different from the Spina Yukima or Spinosum to make the former seaweed as the major red tropical seaweed being commercially produced globally, especially in Southeast Asian region. Kapaficus alvarez reached its highest volume in 2010, that is 1.884 million and declining the following three years. An increasing volume of Gracilaria was recorded from 2000 to 2016, but decreases slightly in 2017, and more decrease was recorded in 2018. It is only Porphyra spp and Porphyra tunera, which recorded increasing volume from 2000 to 2018. These are the major red seaweeds cultivated commercially in the Philippines. That is, three species of Kapaficus as Alvarezai, Malaysianus, and Striatus. One species of Bucuma, that is Denticulatum, and two species of Gracilaria, Firma and Heteroclada. While there are emerging red seaweeds from wild populations awaiting for domestication for commercial cultivation later, these are Beta ficus filipinensis, a source of beta carraginan, Caliophyllis gratilopia, halimenia, and porphyra, which are excellent as sea vegetable salad. Seaweed industry is faced with challenges just like any other industry. These are low productivity and production due to farming, poor farming practices, insufficient financial and technical support from the government and academia, respectively, that is, shortage of capital for expansion, lack of crop insurance, weak industry academia linkages, disease and pest infestation, poor biosecurity measures and farm management, that is, lack of specific policies for seaweed. 
For the industry to remain robust and sustainable, there must be adoption of biosecurity measures and good aquaculture practices, GAQP, for seaweeds, which are all science-based knowledge and information for the framing of policies. We have to maximize available cultivable areas using fast-growing and climate change resilient strains and cost-effective culture techniques and diversification of crops and product applications. The question is, what are we going to do in order for the seaweed industry to remain robust and sustainable? We don't have to reinvent the wheels as they say, but we have to make some innovations based from strong and reliable R&D results. For innovations, a sound farm management and adoption of biosecurity measures are needed, like proper zonation of farm structures to allow free water movement, rigid screening of propagules, only young, robust, and healthy seedlings to be used, acclimation of seedlings for three to five days, especially when these are a source outside your farm area, removal and collection of macro epiphytes and must be brought to the land, strengthening of main lines and support structures to avoid biomass loss, disinfection of cultivation ropes for two to three days sun drying every after use to kill adhering spores and minute unwanted seaweed species and animals. And finally, practice following at least resting the farm area for one year or two for natural nutrient replenishment. Another innovation is shift from shallow water to deeper waters of farming that is at least more than four meters during the lowest tide, especially during this global climate change time. Though the latter culture system entails higher investments than the former, return of investment is higher as claimed by earlier reports like Hurtado 2013 and Valderrama et al. 2013. The use of fast-growing cultivars, like the different strains and morphotypes of Capophycus, is another innovation. Shift from traditional ways of tying seedlings using non-biodegradable soft plastic tie tie to a more eco-friendly and efficient techniques, like use of soft rope like polypropylene as loops and tubular nets are highly advisable. Another innovation is the use of micropropagated plantlets using tissue culture techniques developed from the lab for sea-based nurseries and outplanting purposes. These new and improved cultivars developed from tissue culture techniques are more fast growing and resilient to abiotic stresses, which makes the seaweed more resistant to pests and diseases. Also, the use of seaweed extract by stimulant or SEB is another innovation, as claimed by earlier reports, that is mainly for the induction of multiple lateral shoots and dark pigmentation of thallus. Capophycus alvarezii even when enveloped with filamentous green algae, remains clean, robust, and ice ice free after removal of macro epiphytes. Another innovation is the shift from monocrop culture system to integrated multitrophic aquaculture to be more eco friendly and economically profitable. Inta is the aquaculture of fed organisms like finfish or shrimp combined with the culture of organisms that extract either dissolve inorganic nutrients like the seaweeds or particular organic matter like the shellfish. To summarize this presentation, 
A sustainable industry involves the interrelationship of social and economic aspects to be equitable, social and environmental aspects to be bearable, and economic and environmental to be viable. Thus, a highly sustainable industry is achieved. We should always remember that no man is an island. We need one another to have a comfortable and happy life. A warm and strong harmonious relationship among all the stakeholders of the seaweed value chain is really imperative. As the farmer is the very heart of the industry, he needs financial support and trainings from the government. Also, the Seaweed Industry Association the academia and research centers for the latest technology developed from R&D and innovations, the non-government organizations, both local and international for further support, the Marinal, the world's association of seaweed-based products, and lastly, the end users who purchase and sell the finished products to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anisia, for sharing the, the experience from the Philippines. Philippines is, in fact, the, one of the biggest uh, uh, seaweed producing countries with the largest aquaculture commodity being the seaweeds. I think your experiences are most valuable to us. And also, we greatly appreciate your presence uh, to answer the questions if we have any. And, and now, I think, uh, may I invite Dr. Yugraj Singh Yadava. Uh, you know, Dr. Yadava is a very well-known name in the industry. Uh, he has uh, over 40 years of experience uh, working in the fisheries industry. He, his career, he started from the Indian Council for Agricultural Research as a scientist. And then uh, he had so many caps to his professional career, working as the Fisheries Development Commissioner in New Delhi, and also uh, then moving on to the Bay of Bengal program intergovernmental organization as its director. So uh, I think his presence, his experience in more than 10 countries in the Southeast Asia and also working with the international organizations like FAO will greatly be valuable to the participants here. Dr. Yadava, please uh, welcome to this meeting. Yeah, thanks, uh, Salin, um, for this introduction. And uh, before I begin with my presentation, I must also thank uh, NCDC and uh, NIDAC for extending this invitation to me. I have a PowerPoint presentation, which I would start sharing now. So is the presentation and my voice clear? Yeah, it can be the full screen mode. Yeah, it's on the full screen and my on my screen. Um, the slideshow, I think, uh, it should be OK anyway. Yeah. Just uh, hold on, I'll see if. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's okay, Salin. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, I have a brief uh, presentation uh, which uh, is structured in the following way. Uh, the first uh, four slides have been dealt in one or the other way by the previous uh, presenters. Uh, I would not go into the details. I would go more into the details for the next, uh, next five slides. Uh, but just to brief, uh, uh, provide a brief uh, background uh, uh, on the involvement of the Bay of Bengal program in the 
seaweed farming. Uh, in fact, uh, our involvement has been uh, um, since the mid 1980s, which is now about 35, 36 years old. And in fact, in uh, 1987, in the Bay of Bengal News, a very interesting article came, uh, which was, we are hungry only for seaweed. And this article was based uh, on the work that the Bay of Bengal program carried out in uh, a village called Chinnapalam, which is one kilometer from Pamban Bridge and about 10 kilometers from Rameshwaram. And uh, there was uh, quite a steady engagement of the Bay of Bengal program for many years on seaweed farming, which involved uh, transfer of technology. And, um, you know, we brought out excellent video films for uh, creating awareness. Then my personal involvement in the seaweed farming came in the early part of the century when we partnered with Abiram Seth and uh, uh, we also provided him the permission for introducing Kappa Ficus uh, in Rameshwaram area. I was uh, partly involved with the Coastal Aquaculture Authority at that time. So with this background, I would uh, get into my presentation. Uh, I have a slide, you know, which uh, provides uh, the global picture of uh, uh, seaweed uh, production. And uh, as you see that uh, in 2018, the globe produced about 33 million tons uh, and uh, on an average, 90% of the production came from the farmed species with an average uh, annual growth of about 4%. And um, as you see in the colored uh, diagram on the right-hand side, Japanese kelp, eucuma, and gracilaria are the top species and together they constitute about 70% of the production. China, Indonesia, and the Republic of Korea remain as the main producers, contributing to about 87%. And as we heard uh, from the previous speakers that the seaweed farming is uh, booming. And uh, in 2017, the, globe, uh, uh, the global uh, seaweed uh, production was valued at about USD 880 million, the exported the price. And in this, Indonesia led the global export with about 21% market share, followed by Chile and Ireland. And the most traded commodities are liver, agar agar, red seaweed, and the brown algae, Yundaria pinafetida. Coming to India, our seaweed production has hovered around 26,000 ton during uh, the period 2010 to 18. And in contrast to global trend, uh, only 15% of seaweed is farmed and rest 85% comes from the, from the wild harvesting. The green seaweed makes about 51% and red seaweed is the major farmed species. The production has remained more or less concentrated on the coasts of Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. And I said, despite um, almost three and a half to four decades of intervention, we haven't moved beyond Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. And we hope that the Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana, which the Union Secretary Fisheries had also um, detailed, has provisions to promote seaweed business. And uh, besides extending the production levels in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, PMMSY would also be helpful in taking seaweed to other parts of the coastline. On the industrial applications, I won't spend uh, more than uh, a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, uh, the three uh, key applications which I have presented here in the slide is the agar and uh, alginate and uh, carrageenan. And agar uh, is produced uh, from either gelidium or the gracilaria seaweed uh, and consumption is focused in the pharma bacteriological plates, although there is also some use in food. And uh, Gracilaria agar is mainly used in food and often sold as a single ingredient for home use in Asia. In the alginates, uh, we have the sodium alginate and the prop propylene glycol alginate, widely used in food and industrial applications. 
And carrageenan, which comes from red edible seaweeds, is widely used in the food industry for gelling, thickening, and stabilizing properties. And it's also one of the most commonly known faces of uh, the seaweed all around the world. The demand for seaweed uh, products in India, uh, since the data is not readily accessible, so I'm only presenting the case of agar agar over here. And uh, we see that the agar agar export and import from to India in quantity and in uh, value, and also the value realization in the graphs on my right hand side. The data indicates that there is a growing demand for seaweed products, both for trade and domestic consumption. At the moment, India is a net importer of seaweed products. The unit value of seaweed products imported is usually higher than the exported products. To sum up, there is a scope in the domestic market, both for increasing production and value addition. I would come to the value addition part later in my presentation. The growth in the downstream sectors, uh, the three main sectors, pharmaceuticals, food processing, and the cosmeceuticals. The Indian pharmaceutical sector supplies over 50% of the global demand for various vaccines. And Pharma Vision 2020 by the Department of Pharmaceuticals uh, aims to make India a major hub for end-to-end -end drug discovery. India also plans to set up a nearly rupees 1 lakh crore, which is equivalent to 1.3 billion USD, funds to provide boost to companies to ma manufacture pharmaceutical ingredients domestically by 2023. In the food processing, the Industry accounts for 32% of the country's total food market. And one of the largest industries in India ranked fifth in terms of production, consumption, export, and expected growth. And as we heard uh, the gentleman from the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, India is making all efforts to encourage investments in this business. In the Indian cosmetic products market, which is projected to grow at a CAGR of 4.23% during the forecast period 2020-2025. The cruelty-free, no animal testing, vegetarian and vegan, no animal ingredients at all, beauty market exploded in recent years globally and has been finding a space in the Indian market too. Dr. Blossom Kocher provided uh, some more details on this aspect. Uh, coming to the the value chain uh, part of my presentation, uh, this has been uh, uh, from a publication by Nayesh C in 2007 on the assessment of the CV value chain. And we find that it applies to the Indian scenario very well. We have these sea plant crops, uh, which are red, brown, and uh, green macroalgae, and uh, also the macroalgae and vascular plants. In the building blocks, uh, the possibilities are on modification, extraction, and milling. And again, um, modification, extraction, and other processes, post-harvest treatment. And then in the solutions, we have the biopolymers in functional blends, the processed seafoods, and the prepared nutrients for fed animals. And in the end products, you see, that there are four main blocks. One is the food, personal care, and other products, nutrient and nutraceuticals, sea vegetables, and then, of course, human food, pet food, fish food, fish feed, soil conditioners, etc. So, this is a larger seaweed value chain, which perhaps when India starts producing seaweed uh, in uh, optimal quantities uh, would perhaps be uh, the ideal one. Um, as the, the topic of today's webinar mentions uh, development of entrepreneurship and cooperatives. So here, this uh, particular slide talks about the, the same thing. And at farming and harvesting level, we find that seaweed is more of a labor intensive activity, which uh, uh, a couple of speakers before me also mentioned. 
but the labor intensity decreases and also still remains substantial at the washing, grading, and drying stages. Low level of technology is required for initial processing of seaweeds. And though community entrepreneurship in the above three stages can be brought under the production sphere of the cooperative. I have lessons from Indonesia and Malaysia as case studies, which show you know, how the, the steps would move from one level to the other level. Currently, the farmers and harvesters sell the product at level O, which is also at the lowest level of the value chain. But substantial value addition takes place between levels zero to level one, which in the Indonesian and Malaysian case studies, roughly equal to about 192%. For a profitable and sustainable cooperative, we need to ensure that levels zero to two are captured. Otherwise, the, the business element of the cooperatives remains at the suboptimal level. Finally, the roadmap, as uh, most of us said, and I'm reiterating, seaweed farming is receiving global attention. And with projected growth in the upstream industries, the domestic demand is likely to increase. There is a scope of rural entrepreneurship in seaweed farming through cooperatives. Self-help groups are already in the process, but I think we need to make them more formal and set up the cooperatives. And as I mentioned earlier, a cooperative focusing only on production drying is unlikely to make enough money to grow. We have to make them business savvy and we have to bring the business elements into the cooperative functioning to allow them to optimally realize the value from seaweed farming. The entrepreneurship will be on internalizing as much of the value chain as possible. And finally, a clear government policy would be required that inter alia covers identification of suitable areas, forward and backward linkages, market intelligence, which is very weak at this moment, knowledge and capacity building of stakeholders at different levels. And finally, the most important aspect is access to finance. I conclude with this and once again, thank the organizers for inviting me to make this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yadava, for that interesting uh, presentation on the seaweed valley chain and also so presenting the roadmap for future. Sure. So, yeah, and uh, I would also request the panelists uh, to check the Q&A box as there have been a few questions coming up. I see a few questions on, answered by Dr. Anisia and some of them. So kindly check and answer some of these uh, questions if you can. Yeah, may I invite uh, Mr. Sandeep Naikji for introducing the next speaker, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salid. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, want to mention here that uh, Dr. Jadava's uh, presentation has been excellent. Uh, he looks after a, a project Bay of Bengal program. NEDAC uh, member countries are on the, both on the west side of Bay of Bengal, north side of Bay of Bengal, and east side of Bay of Bengal. So there is a, a lot of uh, synergy which NEDAC can establish. I was also telling uh, Dr. Nguyen from Vietnam, where NEDAC can play a role in seaweed uh, business. Now, it's uh, my privilege to welcome uh, Dr. Atul Patri, uh, Commissioner of uh, Fisheries, Government of Maharashtra. He is the man of action from the ground. A lot of uh, possibilities to expand seaweed business and uh, activities in Maharashtra. Maharashtra has a long coastline. Uh, uh, Dr. Patne has been uh, uh, has been handling critical positions in uh, government of Maharashtra. Now I request uh, Dr. Bhatna to speak. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Am I, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, I share the presentation. Is it available there or should I start from here? Yeah. 
So uh, I would like to keep this test perspective uh, uh, for this seaweed uh, uh, project in the country. Uh, Maharashtra having 720. Uh, next. Next slide, please. Yeah, would definitely love to be part of the $6 billion uh, industry uh, in the seaweed field. And uh, having 720 kilometer coastline, which we uh, share in uh, 7,500 uh, countries coastline, we are fourth in the country. And uh, more than 1 million uh, uh, people are involved in the fishing activity in, the Mar in Maharashtra. So uh, uh, under PMMSY, as it has been mandated that 5% funds should be allocated for seaweed, we also uh, have taken some steps so that in, the, in, the, uh, in Maharashtra, uh, we can promote the seaweed cultivation and also the value addition. Next. Uh, under uh, UNDP support program, earlier we have identified 12 location and 2,700 hectare land in four districts where we can come uh, uh, take uh, the seaweed cultivation uh, project immediately, though the total survey of the state is pending and we have requested CMSCRI for doing the same. Thank you. Uh, next. This is our plan of action under PMSY. This year we have been sanctioned with 2,000 uh, 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 wraps and 800 monoline this year. We have also identified some area in Raigad and Ratnagiri where we want to implement the seaweed program as a pilot project. Um, CMS here has submitted a proposal for handholding where the seaweed uh, seed bank, which is uh, very crucial uh, in this total project, will be set up in Maharashtra. And the IEC as well as under uh, handholding for uh, value addition will be also there uh, from CMS CRI. Next. All the economically important seaweeds in India are, but all these uh, out of these seaweeds uh, varieties, especially the uh, uh, Gracilaria and Capophycus are important in Maharashtra, and we look forward for this type of uh, seaweed varieties in Maharashtra for value addition. Next. Now, uh, from the state's perspective, uh, we would like to uh, uh, put up our uh, demand from all the co coastal states. Actually, there is no seaweed bank in any coastal state, uh, coastal state as such. So, if ICR, ICR run any institute like CMSCRI or other institutes like SIBA uh, uh, or other uh, CMFRI can give one some mandate that the seaweed bank can be set up in all the coastal states along with diagnosis lab and uh, handholding for the training, etc. It will be of immense help to the coastal states to come up with the seaweed plan. Next. And uh, after the presentation, I would like to give two, three suggestions uh, here. Uh, as earlier said that 720 kilometer uh, coastal line in Maharashtra, and uh, we have identified some sites in four districts. Now, uh, under PMMSY, uh, the uh, sort analysis has been done by our PMC, and the main uh, thing, the blockade, will be from uh, the seaweed bank, actually. Secondly, the fishers are farmers, but fishing is not the agriculture. There should be clear-cut guideline that fishing, as here the perception that fishers are going to do this type of activity in Maharashtra or other uh, states also. So they should also get some concessional rate loan as the agriculture uh, ministry is extending and also the benefits under agriculture so that we can promote seaweed for the value addition also. And uh, secondly, the CMSCRI uh, is the only institute in Gujarat which is extending itself, but as the PMSY has already started, doing the survey and giving the suggestions, perhaps uh, we will lose two, three years in this PMSY. Some um, other institutes can also uh, take this responsibility. In, it can be center of excellence, but actually other CMFRI or other institutes can also come up under the ICR to do the survey in the coastal states and help them in uh, finding the locations for uh, seaweed uh, activity. Uh, there can be a special sale under CMSRI to set up this institute from ICR central government fund instead of central sponsored fund, or there can be some civil corporation of India, et cetera, uh, so this type of organizational support where we can look forward for the guidance and the uh, fund also. Uh, doubling farmers' income is one of the uh, goals set up by government of India, and seaweed uh, cultivation is also one of them. If we can uh, bring MSME or Minister of Food Processing, Agriculture, Fisheries together, only then some uh, visible results can be uh, uh, seen in this area. Otherwise, uh, there will not be any clear cut guideline under which scheme the seaweed processing or seaweed cultivation will look uh, for the insurance, value addition, and other supports. 
Uh, as pointed out uh, under clean development mechanism, as it is an organic farming, apart from the carbon credit, now we are talking about nitrogen credit and phosphorus credit also. If something can be attributed to the fishermen, to the society, uh, it will be definitely uh, help uh, them to uh, get some income and increase their livelihood. Lastly, that uh, one minute film was very good. Uh, uh, I think it is from Mandapam, Tamil Nadu, I think. And um, yes, uh, it's good. Uh, one minute educative film. I, I could see that uh, uh, their uh, hands are, are without cracks. They are, uh, they are not suffering from hair loss and their faces are without pigment. But uh, are they really able to cross the subsistence level? Because after Mandapam, there is no success story in the country. Unless and until we bring the investor for valuation process, we are not able to see this type of changes. I can see the sea change in the sea through seed weed, but some hand holding will be required. And perhaps only in that case, we will be able to see their faces glowing, not due to the nutrients of seaweed, but due to actual richness. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Atul, uh, for an, uh, presentation and the uh, highlighting the ways where the PMMSY can uh, move ahead to facilitate different states. Uh, thank you very much for your ideas. Uh, now I will uh, move to uh, uh, here, Dr. R. Govindanajan. Uh, he is uh, from the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Dr. Govindanajan, he uh, heads the R&D unit of uh, Jidus Wellness Limited, India, a major pharma uh, uh, company in India with global presence. Uh, it is more than 18 years in research and development. He has been senior scientist in National Botanical Research Institute, head of product technology in Dabur, Dabur International, head of Himalaya Global Research Center in Dubai. He has been a visiting researcher in King's College, London. He is a visiting professor at NIPER Ahmedabad, Gujarat, and he has been adjunct professor at RAK Medical College and University of United Arab Emirates. Uh, I'll not uh, spend more time. I'll welcome Dr. Govindarajan to make his presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I hope my uh, slide is visible. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Naikji, for uh, kind words. Uh, I think um, since uh, you know, from uh, the last two hours, a uh, lot of them have already presented a lot on uh, what I was about to speak. So uh, making my job very difficult. Uh, like Dr. Ms. Kavita spoke or Dr. Yadva spoke on uh, the uh, you know applications are very clear. But probably I will speak from a user perspective. From a pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, most of these uh, probably a lot of them don't know that it is actually from the seaweed. But you know, carrageenan or uh, agar, uh, you know, are so widely used. You know, for for example, a microbiology lab cannot run without the agar medium today. Any microbiology lab across the globe, you know, runs on the medium which is actually from agar. And uh, you know, from a, um, you half of the tablets that you would find today in the market would have uh, you know one of these uh, either uh, you know the alginates or the carrageenan or uh, a, 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 a thickener or a starch from uh, the seaweed. And fortunately, having worked in National Botanical Research Institute, I also had some work on uh, you know partnering with the lichenology lab or the, the the lab which was working on the mosses. Where I had some publications on uh, the antimicrobial efficacy or converting these seaweeds into a pharmaceutical application. So uh, I don't have. I think I don't have to talk a lot about this. A lot of people have already spoken about the seaweeds. Uh, I would say majorly uh, straight, getting straight into uh, what they are used by us, especially in the industry. I would say uh, majorly for for the manufacture of the colloids, agar, algin, carrageenan. And these are common terms that we use in our industry. Uh, even in food industry, as uh, some, uh, you know, dabar or uh, any juice industry or the cake industry or the jellies that you see, the vegetarian source of jellies, pectins, uh, um, the, you know, uh, 
almost any food industry you take that uh, cakes are all very commonly used and off late we have also seen a lot of pharmacological activity medicinal properties coming out uh, seeds are also be did nutritional profiling though uh, it has not come big in the nutrition industry uh, in the nutraceutical industry but uh, we found a lot of uh, them being very rich in protein vitamins minerals i think a lot of work needs to be done on this Uh, some uh, lot of policy makers are here if we uh, you know work on towards vitamins minerals and uh, trace elements i think we have a good source uh, if sustainable availability is available there and uh, a, a brief number you know a, a lot of these i i was just browsing yesterday or a couple of days back i think a lot of research have happened in the uh, europe and southeast asia the couple of indian papers were available but you know Um, a lot of uh, skew towards uh, europe is what i found and this is something that is common uh, when it comes to seaweeds hydrocolloids are the major com- uh, one components when it comes to industrial application from an industry perspective hydrocolloids are very very important uh, uh, right from uh, any uh, you know from the uh, you know mayonnaise to the, even the modern foods i'm not even taking about the traditional foods even the modern foods uh, cakes pastries ice creams uh all of them use hydrocolloids uh from the uh, seaweeds then we have the nutraceutical industry not hasn't become big but uh, towards getting big pharmaceutical industry of course uses in both ways both for its medicinal properties as well as for uh, for its uh, uh, in the formulation aid of course we have phytoremediation energy and fuel a lot of people have already talked talked about it as hydrocolloids a uh, lot of commercial importance uh, you know alginates um, caraginan and agars have been very common as i said any microbiology lab you find you'll not find agar without agar you can't run a microbiology lab agar users have been from thickening to in confection industries to bakery industries even as stabilizers uh, the cheese that you eat um, a lot of them use uh, agar for their uh, uh, you know stabilization it is also used in as clarifying agents uh, in uh, you know liquor industry alcohol industry it's also used as a laxative sometimes and also as a drug vehicle in uh, Pharmaceutical industry. In cosmetic industry, agar services is constituent. Uh, I have seen a lot of skin creams having agar, but it's de- decreasing uh, uh, the new uh, carbomers that have come. Uh, alginates again. Alginates are uh, the jellies, the vegetarian jellies. Uh, alginates are very common. Uh, they are. They were also used as sodium alginate. It was also used in uh, as emulsions in toothpaste industry. It's very commonly used uh, even uh, in shaving creams and all. and majorly i think one of the major uh, uses is also in the uh, the dentures uh, the denture molds uh, i think ms kavita spoke about it denture molds and denture fixatives also the alginates are very commonly used caraginan i think all of us who have studied pharmacy in our b pharm in pharm uh, we would have studied caraginan as one of the major pharmaceutical aids apart from that you know one of the other where uh, it is not mentioned in any papers but we use it as commonly as a from a user perspective in the, you know when we study anti inflammatory activity of any molecule uh, caraginan is used to induce inflammation in the rats pa pa edema method induce caraginan induced pa edema method is most commonly used and it's uh, it's one of the uh, um, uh, common uh, ones to in- induce edema in rats and that's why we study the anti inflammatory activity uh in the in terms of pharmaceutical use i just found from algae you know they were used as pigments they used as carotenoids uh, as source of pufa pufa especially you know dha a vegetarian source of uh, you know, pufa you know, apart from fish oils a uh, vegetarian source of pufa is, is something that if we can promote it will be one of the biggest things to happen uh, vitamins and minerals of course uh, trace elements i have not seen a lot of papers on this i have not seen a lot of work happening on this but if some concerted effort is done i think the there's a lot of scope uh, on uh, this uh, as a uh, potential source of nutraceuticals in terms of biological applications uh, we found spirulina uh, chlorella surprisingly chlorella tablets are so widely available uh, um, you know as a source uh, both as a nutraceutical uh, you know very widely very popularly available and very expensive also Uh, so prehistoric times seaweeds were widely used as foods only and as chief source of vitamins and minerals but as extraction and uh, modern terms of extraction and isolation came into effect a uh, lot of other activities have been reported from anti cancer to anti viral to anti fungal uh, today we you know we are all sitting with the in a, in a viral pandemic and looking at a lot of anti viral agents uh, in the market uh, probably some considered effect uh, 
antiviral efficacy have been known for uh, potentially carrageenan itself is known to be having antiviral activity but uh, fucoidan have uh, has been reported i found a lot of papers on fucoidan having antiviral properties other pharmacologic property report uh, reported include antioxidant activities they should have antioxidant activity because of their uh, environment that we do uh, there, there were papers on uh, reports on uh, it controls the heart disease and stroke antimicrobial and antifungal activities very very common i have myself published a couple of papers on antifungal activity and inflammatory activity at cancer uh, in diabetes uh, in ulcer treatments and in goiter treatments also is known um so to sum up i found a paper where uh, it summed up saying that in acute applications where all it is used in medicinal applications in in these conditions in rheumatoid arthritis or stomach disorders and in biology properties they were found to be having some immunomodulation and antiviral and activities as well some of the products which are available in the market i could just i could just see you know these are very expensive products if you go to amazon or uh, you know uh, official website you find that you know exorbitantly high cost and they sell like hot cakes also chlorella for example sells at a very high uh, uh, very fucoidan and chlorella are very uh, you know expensive also and uh, those are some of the um, uses that i could find uh, thank you for the question thank you dr govinda rajan for uh, very crisply uh, presenting how seaweeds are being used in the pharmaceutical industry and also uh, telling where the future lies where the industry and uh, the producers can move ahead uh, to reap the benefits in the context of uh, seaweeds thank you very much uh, for participating in this uh, program now i'll request uh, dr salin to take over and introduce dr susila mathew yeah, thank you naiki yeah um, may i introduce dr susila mathew uh, he's a, she's a principal scientist in the central institute of fisheries technology in india it's i i see her premier i see her institute uh, focused on post harvest fish processing technologies and uh, she's also my senior in the college of fisheries in cochin where i had my bachelor in fisheries science and masters in aquaculture so i'm very happy to see her again after a long time and she is a principal scientist uh, focused mainly on the fish processing technology and cft has of late has been focusing on seaweeds and they have a few technologies uh, patented technologies and uh in uh, which have been transformed to business enterprises and uh, we'll be very happy to hear from dr shishila on these aspects thank you thank you dr salin for the introduction so respected delegates of uh, today's international webinar entrepreneurship development on seaweed business by cooperatives and i am dr sushila mathew i am heading biochemistry and nutrition division of icr central institute of fisheries technology and today's uh, topic of discussion is on seaweed based functional foods business models from icr cift so as you know marine flora and fauna they are excellent sources of bacteria compounds and they uh, represent a valuable source of uh, new compounds and among the marine organisms seaweeds they represent as the richest source of bacteria molecules and they are reported to have any health benefits so based on its uh, bioactivities a uh, lot of applications are there for seaweeds in biomedical nutraceutical agriculture and cosmetic fields so when you see the global production of seaweeds nearly 30 million tons of seaweeds are being produced and mainly it is from the culture side and only few 5% is from the nature uh, so uh, there are ma many countries are there uh, uh, which is uh, having good uh, global production of seaweeds mainly the china mainly china japan korea indonesia philippines Vietnam and all. So in India, we are not using seaweed for uh, food, 
because we don't relish the taste of seaweed that much. So our industry is mainly based on hydrocolloids, mainly agar, arginate, and teraginate. And uh, here, uh, the use of seaweeds in nutraceuticals is still underexplored, and especially on in the commercial basis. So in India, the more, mostly the culture is being done in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, and the species that is being used is Capricus alvarez. So regarding the global production, when we see every year there is increase in the culture, but from the wild, the collection, it is uh, almost stagnant over the years. So among the different uh, continents, Asia ranks first, and among different countries, China ranks first in the production. And regarding the bacteria compounds from seaweeds, there are many compounds which are of uh, very importance, like uh, sulfated polysaccharides, uh, they gain importance because of its antioxidant, anti-tumor, and uh, uh, other properties. Similarly, proteins are there because it contains seaweed contains all the essential amino acids. So uh, that way, uh, seaweed is good. Then uh, seaweed contains all polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids, and contains good amount of minerals and trace elements. Similarly, good, con contains good amount of uh, polyphenols, sterols, and pigments, especially as uh, this fucosanthi. So these are uh, these uh, compounds have good bioactivities like antioxidant, uh, antifungal, antimicrobial. Uh, similarly, cholesterol lowering. So these uh, compounds are have gained importance these days. So when we see the biochemical composition of seaweeds from different categories like green, brown, and red, we find a lot of uh, variation among the different classes. Similarly, between the species also a lot of variation we can see in the biochemical composition. So a lot of work we have to do further to make a database on this, the biochemical composition of seaweeds. So regarding the important molecules from seaweed, the most important one is fucodine, which gained much attention these days. It's a sulfated polysaccharide, it is usually extracted from brown seaweed. And uh, this is reported to have antiviral, anti-tumor, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and antibacterial properties. Another important compound which is of importance is fucosanthine. It's a uh, pigment that is uh, uh, also very important because it also has the properties like antioxidant, anti diabetic and inflammatory, it's all proved. So, but in, uh, glo in global production of fucosanthine is only 500 tons. So in India, uh, we are not producing much and a lot more has to be done to increase the production of fucosanthine. So another important compound is alginate. We have an industry in alginate. But of late, these uh, alginates are being used for other pharmaceutical purposes, like uh, it has hypercholomic effect. And even in drug delivery systems, alginates can play a very important role. Another important compound is teraginin. We have an industry on teraginin. Other teraginin and alginate industry is there in India, but this teraginin is having antiviral properties. So the, the, this can be utilized for the for in that respect also. Even in drug delivery systems, carrageenan can be utilized. So when we see the industrial utilization of seaweed, we, as I told, these are other alginate and carrageenan. They are uh, being used as thickening agents uh, and uh, hydrocolloids. So globally, nearly 10 million tons of seaweeds are harvested for hydrocolloid production. In India, the production of these uh, are not that much, uh, though the industry exists. And ICICFT was supporting these industries in the early years. So recently, we have concentrated ICICFT on the fisheries technology coaching. We have um, done intensive research on seaweed and our focus was on nutrient and contaminant profiling of seaweeds, then extraction and characterization of bacteria compounds on seaweeds. Then uh, we established the bioactivities using animal models and we developed some nutraceuticals. And with our agribusiness center, we could uh, transfer these uh, nutraceuticals or functional foods to the industry. So this is regarding our agribusiness incubation center. This is one of the best in ICR. And here we answer the technology through our agribusiness incubation center. Uh, uh, re, uh, this is the any entrepreneur can come and incubate here. And during the first or second year, they will be incubating in our incubation center. 
and uh, along with this researcher scientists uh, they will work together and will bring out the technology and finally when the technology is mature enough they will start their own programs so this is how the aggregation center of cft is working in the past few years nearly 50 technologies we could transfer by this mode so some functional foods we have developed from seaweed and uh, nearly seven technologies we could transfer recently. And one is fucoldine. Uh, Dr. Govindarajan was explaining about fucoldine. So it is a wonder drug. So this actually is a sulfated polysaccharide. And what we have done is uh, like uh, Dr. Yadava was telling, we were trying to like uh, make the value chain. So first extraction process we could uh, standardize. So seaweed, the main problem is that that its uh, cell wall is very thick. So we have to break the cell wall. So we have to use enzymes to extract the uh, active principles from the seaweed. So we use the technology and also we uh, concentrate on green chemistry because we never used any solvents for extract. And we even we used supercritical fluid extraction for the extraction process. And uh, this uh, we freeze dried because if you put in is a water drug, it's having so many properties. So this technology we transferred to amalgam and in in the international market, Pupadan is very costly. And now Amalgam started exporting this product to foreign countries. So they could establish uh, a market there. So uh, CFT is very happy about it. Another thing is our publication on Pupadan, that is WHO has recognized uh, this publication of ICR CFT to promote seaweed as an immune remedy against COVID-19. Another product what we have uh, transferred the technology is a micro encapsulated uh, fucoldine that we mixed with green extract. So the product that we obtained uh, had a very good uh, antioxidant property. So this uh, we actually micro encapsulation is a process by which uh, there will be slow release of uh, fucoldine from inside because we are uh, we are using a wall material and uh, by spray drying we are making the product. So the bioavailability will be better. And this uh, process, uh, this uh, we, uh, for extraction, again, we use the green, uh, green process, green technology process. And, and this uh, we transfer to Body and Naturals Private Limited. Uh, so they have brought the product to the market. Another uh, technology the, what we have transferred is because when we extract the fucoldan, uh, it was uh, in, like uh, it is in the form of brown color because we are extracted from sargassum. So we mixed it with grape juice and we made a juice out of it. And this technology we have transferred to Kerala New Pharmaceutical Private Limited. Then this uh, fucoldan again, we uh, mixed with the yogurt and uh, the consistency of the yogurt uh, we maintained uh, by adding fucoldan and the amount to be added also was standardized. And this product actually we have transferred to Kerala Cooperative Milk uh, Federation that is Milma and they are in the process of making it. Another uh, technology what we have uh, transferred is seaweed cookies. So with seaweed we have incorporated to cookies that in improved the nutritional value of cookies. So fiber content also could be increased, protein content could be increased by incorporating seaweed to the cookies. And this uh, technology actually we have transferred to a local end owner. So these are the technologies so we have transferred already and another uh, some technologies are in the pipeline so one is seaweed puree so this is an extra uh, extruded product actually one woman entrepreneur she was very successful incorporating a uh, prawn extractive to uh, puree and so that increased the nutritional value for uh, this uh, puree because puree it is not having usual uh, extruded snacks they are not having much nutrition value so when we added Prone to that, it improved the uh, nutritional value of puree. So here what we did, we added um, seaweed also, and that uh, improved the shelf life of the product. And this uh, um, product is ready for commercialization.
Another one what we have done is a seaweed, we made a seaweed aqua booster. So this um, we've tried to make some fish feed uh, supplement from brown seaweed. And uh, so we did some research on that and we found that along with the seaweed food extract, if you add phytosan or vanillic acid, that will improve the uh, nutritional value of the product. So this product is also ready for commercialization. Then uh, we extracted seaweed fiber and uh, this uh, that we did from Gracelaria edulis and our product is 96% uh, dietary fiber. Uh, so uh, this we can compete uh, the fiber that is available in the market. So this technology is also ready for commercialization. Then we have added uh, seaweed to sausage because uh, sausage industry is uh, facing some crisis now. So uh, if you can incorporate some nutrient to uh, sausage, definitely that will add value to the sausage. So we try to add seaweed and uh, the level as well as to be added and uh, how uh, the composition can be maintained. So all that we have worked out. So this technology is also ready for commercialization. Then we are incorporated seaweed to noodles. So, so pungish is made along with the seaweed. Uh, we added uh, to noodles and we made the noodles and uh, uh, definitely it is having more nutritional value. Then uh, seaweeds, um, especially the arginines that can be used as a pot. So that is for preserving uh, the um, fish products. So uh, it can act as a seaweed coat. So this also we have standardized how much to add the alginate, how to prepare all that. Another one is uh, like a seaweed edible wrap. So uh, if, uh, this is for edible products. So along with the food, uh, the wrap also can be taken inside. This wrap will definitely increase the shelf life of the product. So here what we used is a sodium alginate and protein based uh, uh, filling that we prepared and we found that it is increased the shelf life of the product. So recently we introduced a three products to the market that is uh, to become part of the uh, fight against COVID-19. So it is a combination of three. That is one is a hand sanitizer in that we uh, added uh, Fukodan and Karajinan um, because they have antiviral properties. And there is there was a gargle that is uh, just to destroy the virus uh, in your uh, mouth and other uh, 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 mouth and another one of uh, you and capsule that is to uh, improve the immunity so these three products uh, we had transferred to body and natural private limited and they are now bringing that to the market so uh, regarding seaweed, uh, we have done uh, some work on nutraceutical production and also we have attempted to transfer the technology to the entrepreneurs and uh, for sus uh, sustenance of this, uh, there should be a supply of seaweed uh, in a regular basis so that for that seaweed culture has to be promoted. So then uh, this uh, biofertilizer and biostimulant industry is already existing. So that also should be maintained uh, for uh, to, uh, to improve the uh, seaweed utilization. Then other areas where we can utilize is on biofuels and cosmetics. So biofuel, the National Biofuel Policy of India targeted 20% of planting of biofuels by to 2013. That seaweed can play major role. Similarly, seaweeds uh, can be used as ingredients in bio uh, cosmetic production also. So um, thank you, that's all from my side. I thank the organizers, uh, especially the uh, Department of Fisheries, NCDC and NDA for giving me this opportunity and giving ICICF the opportunity to present before. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shushila, that for the wonderful presentation and the, the highlighting all the uh, really patented products in a way that has penetrated the business uh, in, in, in uh, pharmaceuticals or whichever way that can. Um, yeah, I would now request uh, Mr. Sandeep Nayakji to take over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shushila. Uh, you have uh, really given a lot of uh, ideas to do expand the business of cooperatives. You have already working transfer technology to one of the cooperatives uh, in the dairy sector in Kerala. And thank you very much. 
now i'll introduce my colleagues dr rajnandesh gopal and mr nilesh patil from ncdc dr gopal is a phd in face endocrinology uh, he currently works uh, in the uh, ncdc as deputy director uh, mr nilesh patil uh, he is uh, an mba in uh, agri business management and he has done bachelor of fisheries science from college of fisheries in ratnagari he currently works as assistant director in ncdc i request my colleagues to make their presentation thank you very much sir for the opportunity to share our थैंक यू वेरी मच सर फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू शेयर अवर व्यूज आप सब को मेरा सादर नमस्कार लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू दिस इज वन ऑफ द क्लोजिंग प्रेजेंटेशन बेस्ड ऑन द कंसेप्ट नोट दैट वॉज शेयर विथ ऑल ऑफ यू बिफोर दिस इवेंट हेयर द फोकस इज ऑन सीविड सीनेरियो एंड इट सपोर्ट सिस्टम इन इंडिया इज अ थ्रस्ट एरिया दिस प्रेजेंटेशन इज बाई माई सेल्फ आर एन गोपाल एंड माई कलिंग निलेश पाटिल this slide highlights the global scenario of seabed business the most important part is here to tell that even at the production level the seabed business has effectively grown more than 100% in last 10 years from 14.7 million ton to 30.4 million ton during 2005 2015 you can see in this graph very and not only that more importantly seabed business in this is worth of 12 us dollar revenue per year assessed by fao there is a rising demand of sea business the key players are obviously producers various fmgc companies different research organizations medicinal and cosmetic manufacturer fertilizers and many more the global scenario it is obvious that the consumer are getting more aware about the benefit and use of seabed hence the demand of seabed business is increasing day by day the seabed extract business is dominated by mainly europe more than 80% seabed production come from china and russia and the same region is the leading exporter including korea and philippines and the main exporter are japan and the united states of america in india the main production area are tamil nadu and gujarat coasts and its island or yahan pe lagbhag 200 से 300 सौ स्पीसीज पाए जाते हैं जो कॉमर्शियली बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है और लास्ट ईयर 2020 में इनका प्रोडक्शन लगभग 26,000 टन था हाउ एवर ड्यू टू द पोटेंशियल ऑफ इनहसिंग द इनकम एंड ट्रेडिशनल फेसर फोक द लार्ज इंप्लॉयमेंट जनरेटिंग अपॉर्चुनिटी इन इंडिया इट हैज टेकन एज ए फोकस बाई गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया द अपॉर्चुनिटी कम्स फ्रॉम वेरी लॉन्ग कोस्ट लाइन that is more than 800 8000 km with mainly inhabited by traditional and marine fisher folk it will enhance the livelihood of fisher folk uh, communities and it will also strengthen the supply of seaweed based products and its application and equally importantly it is essential for uh, environmental uh, for the ecosystem it will yeah. be a major tool to help treat our pollution and mitigate both co2 and co2 emission the steep growth seen in the consumer demand across the sector both in domestic and international that's why government of india has planned taken as a uh, to promote civil as a special case as a catalyst on a mission mode project as our secretary sir has uh, highlighted in the in the inauguration of the presentation now i request my colleague les patel to continue the presentation thank you thank you very much sir and good afternoon to everyone as we saw earlier that there is opportunity for civil business in india and hence government of india is now working as a catalyst for civil business activities it has trust on development and growth of civil businesses and abhi 2020 mein bharat sarkar ne pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana ki shuruaat ki hai and it will bring big organization and institutions like ncdc and fdp and others together uh 
Very importantly, it will catalyze businesses by supporting infrastructure, knowledge, handholding businesses, and building international collaboration. In the next year, the whole Bharat will be made of 720 fisher farmer producer organizations, which will support NCDC in making it. NCDC is promoting three C concepts, which is cooperative, corporate collaboration, including with industry houses like CCI, ASCOM, PhD CCI, ICC, and others. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now civil sector is part of blue revolution, and the total outlay of Pradhan Mantri Matasya Sampada Yojana is more than three billion dollars. Out of this total outlay, more than hundred billion dollars has been allocated for civil sector, and it has been expected that it will create eight hundred thousand employment in the civil sector. It will bring socio-economic empowerment of coastal fishers, especially fisher women. It will support infrastructure and activities to mitigate business risk and business growth. Financial support by government by way of which is 100% subsidy for the projects like genetic improvement program and nucleus breeding center. It will support innovative projects on civil business activities. It will also support businesses with 40% subsidy and for some special cases, 60% subsidy for establishment of civil culture by various ways like raft, monoline, tube net method, including inputs, and it will support establishment of seed bank for civil activities. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some challenges. As we discussed earlier, there are some challenges in civil business activities, like there are inefficient production. Uh, there are lack of sense, uh, lack of business in some of farmers. There are no doubt there are certain marketing constraint in this industry. Uh, due to low trust on this civil business activity, there are very limited extension services available. Uh, there is lean period in monsoon due to coastal turbulence, but this is only for a short period of time. And there are ineffective collaboration with research and industry. And most importantly, there is very limited credit and financial support available for civil, civil business activity. But, but all these challenges has been addressed in Blue Revolution 2020. And NCDC is also looking forward to support civil business activity in all part of India. On the other side, is as we discussed earlier, there is business demand in medicine sector, cosmetic sector, industrial uses, export market, and food and fertilizer sector. And by considering all these, uh, NCDC is coming with a very interesting development model for civil business activities. It will leverage scheme grant from government of India, and as NCDC's capability to sub give credit support, and NCDC's own training institute, which is known as LINAC, will give handholding support for civil business training and capacity building activity. Ladies and gentlemen, we are targeting primary fisheries cooperatives, fish farmer producer organization, and federated SHGs. And the major agenda of this proposed model is to have economically sustainable development. It will bring long-term income growth. It will add product diversification. It will have sustainability benefit. It will build partnership with user industry, and it will have collaboration with scientific research. And the idea behind this model is to expand the business ecosystem of fisher cooperatives with larger supply chain processors and users and to bring holistic and long term focus on scaling up of civil business uh, civil businesses i am hopeful that this is useful to you and we have shared concept not on civil farming with all of you and jo cooperative society and cdc say credit support lena chahti ho ya jo society humse training support lena chahti ho wo national cooperative development corporation ki is pate par hame sampark kar sakte and we are looking forward a very synergistic relationship with all of you thank you very much thank you uh, thank you dr rajnares and uh, mr nilesh patil now i request uh, the coordinators to take over dr salim uh, thank you, Sandeep ji. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, there was a last presentation and we have some time for Q&A. Uh, I see some of these questions have been answered in the chat box, but may I now uh, ask a question to Dr. Thierry Chopin because he, it's so late for him. So uh, there is a question on the inland indoor farming because seaweed is mostly can be farmed in the sea, but what is the prospect so how it can be done in the inland areas or indoor indoor conditions is it really feasible uh, question is for me yes yeah yeah um i would say um yes uh, in in sea water we use seaweeds but um uh, practice that is very close to uh, integrated multitrophic aquaculture is also uh, aquaponics. 
and uh, we are working also on aquaponics because, for example, the the beginning of salmon is in fresh water. Um, and I, I think there was a, a question somebody asked a question about uh, in Kerala on the backwaters, and uh, which I visited once, and it's a beautiful region of India. Uh, and uh, it, I think in the backwaters, it's much more fresh water. So maybe instead of seaweed, there is room to grow uh, um, aquatic plants. But aquatic plants uh, and other plants that you can grow in aquaponics, uh, aquaponics is the same principle as IMTA. Uh, so I think there is quite a lot of work that can be done. Yes, uh, yeah, connected with that, the production side. Uh, in many countries, there is an issue of leasing the public open water bodies in the coastal area. So what kind of system in, in for example, in Canada, uh, how is it the licensing system works? How the coastal areas are allocated for seaweed farming? Well, uh, I think, uh, like for example, we are trying to develop seaweed uh, aquaculture in Canada through uh, integrated multitrophic aquaculture. And I think the concept on the biology of IMTA, nobody uh, disagree with it. Uh, everybody uh, believe in the biology of IMTA. The biggest problem we have at the present time is uh, regulations. Um, and uh, in Canada, most of the regulation in aquaculture are uh, addressing uh, salmon uh, aspect because I would say 85 to 85% of uh, aquaculture in Canada is salmon. So a lot of things is based on uh, sites for salmon, um, rotation, uh, there was mentioning of following and we think, but the, it's a following for uh, salmon. And then we said, how do we uh, have the following for seaweed, the following from invertebrates, coordinated with the following of fish. So, so there is a lot of regulation issue because in Canada, like in many other country, uh, aquaculture is still managed one species at a time. Uh, there is not too many country, I think, that are looking at managing on the species interactions and all these things. So um, aquaculture at the present time is very much like fisheries management one species at a time, and we have to go away from that. So I would say the biggest issues at the present time are regulatory issues. Thank you, Dr. Thierry. Uh, I would like to ask the same question to Dr. Anisia and also Nguyen and also Dr. Yadava later. How the, because there have been a lot of questions on the production issues in the leasing of water bodies. How does it work in, in Philippines, for example, Dr. Anisia? Uh, insofar as the Philippines is concerned, uh, uh, it, um, you have to get a permit from the local government. It's very minimal. It's only by hectares. And um, normally, um, one single um, seaweed farmer can only farm one hectare. So that's only how many in dollars. Very minimal. So they have to get a permit from the local government, from their barangay, the smallest unit form of government in the Philippines. And normally the uh, seaweed farms are all in the, um, the provinces, so they get it from the local government. They have a permit. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, is it the, how is the system uh, in Vietnam? Uh, I think it's... Um... So what uh, quite similar to uh, the Philippines. So uh, the land and uh, the, the water surface is uh, belong to the local government, and they can uh, can uh, lend it to uh, to farmer, and they they, they can use this. Uh, I don't have good data how much they can they can uh, hire, but uh, not not very much. But in case that. 
in case of the large company, they can uh, request a large area and uh, the local government can uh, may, maybe offer them uh, an, uh, a large area uh, for, for, for a, a specific uh, production area. So it's, it's also possible. Is it, uh, is it uh, given to individual farmers or even cooperatives? Sorry? The, the license is given to cooperatives or the only individual farmers? Uh, both, both is available. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yadava, can you, can you please highlight any Indian experience? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Selin. Uh, as we are aware, the area between zero to 12 nautical miles in the sea is within the jurisdiction of the coastal states and the union territories. So, any approval or permission within this area has to come from the states and the union territories. But so far, there is no clear cut policy on the allocation of areas or leasing. So I would, what I would suggest over here is that the Ministry of Fisheries and Animals Beginning may consider bringing out uh, a, a model policy which can be uh, shared with the states and the union territories, their views taken, and then you know a policy can be uh, can be placed and put in operation. Because at this moment uh, there is nothing uh, concrete, you know, which allows communities to take up uh, seaweed farming. Uh, what has been done in um, uh, Mandapam, Rameshwaram, Tamil Nadu area, and also in Gujarat is more a traditional type of thing, you know, which has been going there for many decades. But I think we need to have a formal policy, a clear cut guideline on how, how, how does, you know, a cooperative or an individual farmer get into the seaweed business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yadava. And I think uh, because of time constraint, I will uh, end up with one more question. Uh, I think to the Dr. Blosam Kochar and also Ms. Kavita. Uh, there have been questions on the, uh, on the procurement. Uh, for example, how is the procurement strategy? For example, do you get enough material from the Indian coast that you procure for your products? And uh, how does it uh, benefit the farmers? Like, are you able to give a better price or how do you motivate the farmers to, to supply the, the ingredients, the raw material that you want? I think you are muted, Dr. Blossom. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we get enough because it we get enough product from there, but we don't get it directly from the farmers. You know, we get it, we get it through a second person, a company. So, so it's th through that. But now after this, I think I shall try and get it directly from the farmers. And like I can like I'm telling we like I think we'll go in more into this, into seaweed and promote it more. So I think we'll, we'll definitely need a lot more seaweed and so we can get it from the farmers this time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Ms. Kavida, your comments on that, please. Yes, so we, uh, we procure directly from the farmers. So Sargassum Vaiti is widely uh, available in the sea. So that is uh, collected and that's easily available. Uh, when it comes to the cultivated seaweed, so the Capophycus, that... Um, I mean, we have, so the way we incentivize the farmers is we do uh, procure bamboo for the raft. Uh, we, uh, you know, we keep, even for the sargassum uh, fisher folk who go out for us, we invest in their boat. So we right. do a lot of development in the Mandapam area to also to help them and to make it a profitable venture for them. But uh, ultimately, Capophycus is, uh, is uh, pretty affected by, uh, for example, this year with the cyclones, all the rafts got uh, completely destroyed if there is a change in the sea temperature. So the sea salinity this year um, dipped to about 15%. So a lot of the weeds rotted. So there are a lot of challenges when it comes to the cultivated uh, seaweed, but uh, sargassum and turban area, which are uh, just harvested from the sea, those are much more widely available. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we it's time we wrap up. And before I move to... Uh, I request Dr. Sandeep, uh, Mr. Sandeep Nayakji for his closing remarks. I think 
my feeling is that this webinar has been quite a bit uh, successful and looking at the q and a the questions it has generated the 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 interest it has generated among the participants not only from india from uh, many parts of uh, the uh, in asia uh, this is really an eye opening because we we can all, we always say we cannot call this as a seaweed because it, this is really a misnomer this is not a weed at all it's a very valuable marine species and uh, the numerous products that come out of it uh, i think we have unlimited potential opportunities for expansion of the seaweed farming and the industry uh, i think uh, 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 nidac and ncdc will be continuing this effort jointly with the government of indian uh, the ministries and other regional organizations and uh, i really congratulate uh, mr sandeep naik ji uh, chairman of ncdc uh, and also the chairman of nidac for his wonderful contribution and initiative supporting the other line ministries in india and also the regional organizations thank you very much and i would request uh, mr sandeep naik ji for his closing remarks and wrapping up uh thank you professor salin uh, this has been a uh, real uh, good experience to carry forward the seaweed business in all its uh, forms across the asia pacific and particularly in india we have uh, found lot of complementaries uh, complementarities uh, whether it is in canada or in uh, different nadac countries uh, nadac member countries thailand philippines uh, Uh, indonesia uh, sri lanka india bangladesh uh, and some african countries middle eastern countries we will be uh, working towards that facilitating cooperatives to come forward with the business ideas involving uh, seaweed uh, uh, business what uh, dr jadava told that uh, in the value chain we have to focus at focus on level 1 and level 2 for the cooperative to the farmer so that they get maximum value uh, just not being being a producer uh, overall i uh, would like to thank the both the co joint coordinators colonel vikramjit singh from the national academy uh, for cooperative research and professor salim uh, and all the experts and participants who have uh, um uh, together to make it a such an uh, enriching experience uh, today we had uh, i'll now formally request my colleague ms uh, indarjit kaur director in ncdc to present a vote of thanks good afternoon i am indarjit kaur from national cooperative development corporation government of india it is my privilege to present vote of thanks on behalf of the organizers this event has been jointly organized by department of fisheries ministry of fisheries animal husbandry and dairy government of india linac ncdc department of agriculture cooperation and farmers welfare ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare government of india and nidac bangkok i thank dr rajiv ranjan indian federal secretary for fisheries for addressing the webinar as chief guest I thank Shri Manoj Joshi, Additional Secretary, Indian Federal Ministry for Food Processing Industries. I am thankful to Dr. Atul Patne, Commissioner of Fisheries for Maharashtra State, Dr. Terry Chopin, Professor of Marine Biology, University of Brunswick, Canada, has taken pain in taking part in the webinar at a time which is very early in the morning in Canada. A special thanks to him. I thank Dr. U. S. Avasti, MD, IFCO. for taking part in the webinar and for his address on seaweed extract based extract based bioactivator sagarika for increasing farmers profitability dr yugraj singh yadav director bay of bengal program intergovernmental organization has wonderfully explained the industrial applications of seaweed farming my thanks to him i specially thank dr blossom kochar chairperson blossom kochar group for explaining the use of seaweed in cosmetic industry i am thankful to dr r govinda rajan head research and development zydus wellness limited for giving an insight into the usage of seaweed in pharma industry 
a pioneer in seaweed industry mr abhiram seep has all the thanks from us i'm thankful to ms kavita nehemia for sharing her valuable experiences we are thankful to dr nguyen van nguyen deputy director research institute for marine fish vietnam for sharing in detail the seaweed research link business in vietnam and to dr anisia hurtado university of philippines for sharing innovations in red seaweed cultivation we are thankful to dr cecilia matthew principal scientist icar sift for providing an insight on the business models in seaweed based functional foods i thank my colleagues dr rajneresh gopal and mr nilesh patel fisheries division ncdc for highlighting highlighting seaweed scenario in india i thank colonel bikramjit singh chief director linac ncdc and professor krishna r selin honorary director nedac bangkok for very effectively coordinating the webinar and moderating the sessions thank you i consider it a privilege to express my heart heartfelt gratitude to the person behind this event shri sandeep kumar nayak managing director national cooperative development corporation thank you sir for conceptualizing this unique and wonderful webinar and providing your guidance and leadership a big thanks to our teams of linac ncdc head office and regional offices of ncdc for putting in their best efforts in making this webinar a success last but not the least we are thankful to our wonderful participants who have joined the webinar through zoom and other live stream platforms once again thank you very much to all eminent speakers and participants namaskar jai hind thank you very much thank you namaskar thank you very much nice to see you all yeah thank you